Well, good morning, everyone. It's the uh, 14th of March, 2023. Uh, welcome to Clearwater County's regular council meeting for that date. Um, as a reminder, all public meetings are live streamed and recorded. Any verbal or written information provided may be included in public documents as per the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, FOIP 40. Dash one, the practice has worked. Um, with that, there has been a agenda uh, circulated. Would there be any uh, additions or deletions to that agenda? Uh, Councillor Northcott, please. Um, I just have some questions for this section 3.1 for those meeting minutes from February 21st. Okay, we will get, we will get to those. Okay, just wanted to make sure that I okay. get that opportunity. For sure. Thanks. So, so with that, okay, a motion to adopt the agenda as circulated. All those in favor? And that's carried. And now we'll move to the adoption of the minutes. Uh, and there are two groups of those minutes, one from the special council meeting of the 21st of February, and of course another from the 28th of February. Uh, Councillor Northcott, I believe you have some questions about the first one. Yeah, I do. It was just in regards to information I was... Um, I didn't see in here for the meeting minutes for the 20, February 21st special council meeting for the total ten, the, the attendance numbers for everybody that attended. I don't know if that needs to be included. And also <clears throat> there, was a, there was a petition with uh, many residents that had signed. I also didn't see that information in here as well. And the motion on 4.1 um, to table the second reading for the MDP. I didn't see any direction uh, given in that motion at that time at that meeting. I didn't, there was, it was just basically a motion from what I recall is to table the second reading of the MDP, but in the, in 4.1 it does read that there was direction, uh, you know, for administration to amend the document, but I don't remember any of that being in that motion. Okay, so you've suggested a number of amendments. Did, Can yeah. we maybe check them off one by one? One by one? <laughs> Absolutely. So one, I didn't see the attendance, like for the, for the attendance for all the residents that had signed in. I didn't see that information in here. Okay, Mr. Mr. Ammons, I think you may have some uh, insight on this. Thank you, Reeve Lloyd. Um, the names uh, of the people that sign in for registration are for registration purposes only. Uh, so they typically aren't attached. The names that are in the minutes are actually the ones that came up and spoke. Um, in regard to the petition uh, that was handed, that becomes background of the minutes. Uh, staff has gone through. Uh, it does not elevate to the level of petition. Uh, many of them, uh, there was redundancies in names. Um, they weren't signatures, they weren't dated, um, so it doesn't elevate. But it was great information. Uh, so staff did take that information, separate out uh, as to issues, uh, some were only opposed to Section 10, some were opposed to the whole MDP, some were on the fence, and we did categorize because it was still great information, and that will be coming back to the MDP committee for information, but not as a petition. Okay, did, did we have to capture, or should, those, should that information be captured in these minutes, just the, the number of attendants in total that, that attended the public hearing, and maybe the, the, those numbers for the people that were on that piece of paper, maybe just as information, or? Uh, as far as the names that were provided to Reeve Lougheed, I would suggest that by the time we took out the redundancy and validated, uh, capturing the, the number was well after the meeting. Uh, it could be mentioned that a list of names was handed to Reeve Lougheed in the minutes, that could be added. Um, but to give the, the number, Councillor Northcott, at, at that meeting, we had no way or time to validate, um, but we've done that work since. I don't know, I just think in my opinion, it'd be nice to be able to see some of that information captured in these minutes. Um, okay. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I guess the last one, so that was my first two points. And then the last one was for the motion itself. I just, as I recall, the motion was just to table second reading, but there's more, there, there's a lot more in here that it directs administration to amend the document as per consideration of the representations made at the public hearing and bring the bylaw to a future council meeting for prior for review prior to proceeding with second reading. I'm, maybe I'm 
I'm missing something, but what, what were you, in that particular um, resolution, what were you? It was just tabled, from what I recall. On the February 21st meeting, it was just tabled. There was no direction given to, to anybody to make amendments. It was just tabled, from what I recall. Okay. Um, yes, Mr. Emmons? Staff did go back over the live stream um, and validated uh, that there was direction given to I amend the document and bring back um, for for the committee's review. I went back over the live stream too. Not. I did. I still recall it, and when I watched it, it still just comes back. Like the way I understand it is to table second reading, but no direction was given to amend it. Okay, we will validate. Okay. Okay. That's, so that's in that case, we will table <laughs> adopting 3.1 at this time, then? Is that yes, please. what you'd like to do? Yes, please. Okay. I'd like to table So these. we have a motion to table adoption of 3.1. I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, but I'll let you do that. Absolutely. You know, that's, 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 <clears throat> that's the exact words I'd like to use. I'd like to table uh, section 3.1. So table a special council meeting minutes from the February 21st, 2023 Special Council meeting. I think okay. I said that right. Thank okay. you. Any discussion around that? Uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I just wanted to note that uh, Councillor Cermak was present, um, and this is showing that he wasn't. Um, that was my only amendment request. Good, good yeah. catch there. That was, that's very <laughs> important that yeah. we have all present. <laughs> accounted, All accounted for. Accounted for. Um, with regards to the motion piece of it, um, I did add background when I gave my, my motion um, that was to uh, give the opportunity to build amendments and bring them back for consideration. So I do remember saying that. I didn't review the tape, but I do remember saying that that's why I wanted it tabled. Does that become background to the motion then? Because I feel that that's still in important information to have that that is something that I've suggested when I put the motion to table. So just throwing that out there. So did we catch, capture uh, uh, Deputy Reed Melhoff's catch of Councillor Cermak? Yes. And uh, Councillor Cermak. Yes. Thank you. Um, Robert's rules of these meetings have taken out tabled it is postponed. Can we please start using the right words? Thank you. Have we ever defined that we use Robert's rules? <laughs> okay, thank you. Because there are more than one meeting procedure, so I know we've kind of adopted our own from time to time. So uh, as long as we are all on the same rule book, I'm fine with that. I said shelved originally at the public hearing, and it got confusing, so I went back to tabled. <laughs> yeah, put it on the shelf or something. I think I heard, if I remember right. Anyway. Um, so we do have a motion to table 3.1. Any further discussion on that? Um, okay, I'll call that question. All those in favor? Uh, okay, that's that's carried. Uh, it takes us to 3.2. Uh, that is the regular council meeting of the 28th of February, 2023. Any errors or omissions in that one? Seeing none, I would look for a motion to adopt those minutes then. Councillor Graham? <laughs> uh, all those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that takes us to item 4.1, which is a delegation and a presentation from our local RCMP detachments. And I think we'll start maybe by, uh, by welcoming you gentlemen this morning, and then we'll have uh, council introduce themselves as we go around the table, please. Councillor Graham. Good morning, I'm Sydney Graham, Councillor for Division Two. Good morning, Jordan Northcott, Division Four, Councillor. Uh, welcome, Jenny Melhoff, Division One, Councillor, and Deputy Reef. Uh, good morning, Daryl Lawheed, Councillor for Division 3 in Reeve. Good morning, gentlemen. Neil Ratcliffe, uh, Division 5. Welcome, Brian Cermak, Division 6 Councillor. Hello, Michelle Swanson, Division 7. Good morning, Murray Hagan, Director of Corporate Services. Good morning, Rick Emmons, CAO. 
If you Good morning, please. everyone. Pierre Saint Cyr, Sergeant in Charge of Rimby. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Sergeant Darren Monroe, Ops Support and CEO for Rocky Mountain House. Good morning, Staff Sergeant Carl Dinsdale, Detachment Commander for Rocky Mountain House. Great. Well, welcome this morning, gentlemen. We look forward to uh, what you have to present to us, and uh, it's always excited to hear from our, our local detachments. Just kick off. All right, thank you very much for having me. Uh, let's uh, speak to the uh, third quarter statistics, which covers October 1st, 2022, to uh, December 31st, 2022. Um, our priorities, uh, let's go by order. Our first priority was crime reduction, property crime, crime against uh, oil and gas industries, and uh, overall rural property uh, crime. In uh, that quarter, we had 127 files uh, involving motor vehicle uh, theft, theft from motor vehicle, break and enter, stolen property, or possession of stolen property. Um, and from uh, that, we had the eight motor vehicles uh, that were recovered, 25 break-ins uh, that we dealt with uh, with regards to um, property or a business. Um, overall, property crime is decreasing about 5%. 51% uh, motor vehicle theft, seeing an increase in 12% in uh, general theft. Uh, oil and gas industries, uh, we had uh, 10 files during that quarter specifically. Two break-ins, three mischiefs, and five theft of copper wire and equipment. Keep in mind that this is what's being reported to us. It doesn't mean that, well, I've reported this. Well, sometimes people think that they just spoke to an officer or mentioned it on Facebook, online, uh, one of the apps. And if we can't follow up with that person, then really we can't really follow up on that. Our second priority uh, was to communicate effectively and engage the communities uh, that we police. Uh, so during that quarter, uh, we tried to uh, enhance our presence, um, involvement with various activities uh, throughout that period. Uh, I gave a couple of uh, presentations on fraud, uh, property crime protection, things like that, uh, with our local citizens on patrol. I also attended the uh, Gull Lake Citizens on Patrol uh, meetings and uh, provided uh, some statistics, uh, identity fraud and um, identity theft uh, presentation as well. Uh, we participated in some of the uh, red search duties as well for Remembrance Day. Um, oh yeah, we did the Cram the Cruiser event on December 6th where we collected uh, 759 pounds of food uh, we met with the uh, Lions Club on May 12. Oh, sorry, that's another one. My apologies. Uh, attended uh, two meetings with uh, elected officials and three meetings with the gas and oil industries uh, group. Our third priority is enhancing road safety. Uh, we have a lot of issues with speeders, uh, seat belt. Uh, people are non-compliant with wearing the seat belt. Um, we had a couple of impaired, actually. We had 17 impaired for that period. Uh, so we're proactive with uh, our partners from the sheriff's uh, department, uh, set up some roadblocks, and we're effectively able to remove 17 impaired drivers in three months, which is decent for our area. Uh, because we have Highway 20, Highway 53, and uh, the nucleus of uh, Rocky Mountain House, people coming in from Drayton Valley, using the back roads, uh, drinking too much, and uh, trying to tempt the fate. Generally speaking, um, for the same period uh, last year, so October to December, uh, total criminal code offenses in 2021, 128, in 2022, 135. So a variance of about 5%, which is normal. When it comes to person's crime, steady. 16 in 2021, 15 in 2022. Property crime, 
about the same, uh, 92 in 2021 and 103 in 2022. Other criminal code offenses uh, involved a breach, a non-compliance, a suppression checks, and so on and so forth. Somebody on conditions, uh, on probation, uh, released on the interim order. Um, <coughs> drugs, uh, surprisingly enough, what's reported to us, we only have one case. Yeah, that's, I'm as surprised as uh, you are. Um, other provincial statutes, 35 in comparison to 55, so a slight increase. Motor vehicle collisions, um, about the same. I mean, 57 in 2021 and 72 in 2022, so an increase of 26%, which keep in mind that because of that period of the year, roadways, inclement weather, um, usually there's an increase of uh, collisions. Another thing that uh, we've been busy with is mental health calls. Uh, we've went from 17 to 25. That period of the year, uh, you have to factor in the time of the year with regards to um, daylight. Um, it's the holidays. People are having difficulties coping with the burden, financial burden of uh, the holidays. And usually our suicide uh, rates increases December, January, and February. A question from uh, uh, Deputy Reed Milhoff. If yes, you could. Uh, thank you, Eve. Um, does you're the RIMBY detachment commander? Correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you guys utilize the um, RN with an officer yes. program RPAC, in RIMBY? Yeah. So the way that the RPAC works for us is it's stationed out of Rocky Mountain House. Okay. Covers all the way up to Drayton Valley, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> so Drayton, Black Fall, uh, Black Falls, Sylvan Lake, RIMBY, Rocky. And I think it goes as far as uh, Innisfail, Innisfail and, and Sun, Sun Gary, I believe. Don't, don't quote me, but yeah. They cover uh, a vast area. Yes. So it's one unit, uh, unless they have a second one right now on standby. As far as I know, it's only it's one coming. unit. It's, it's coming. There, uh, there's also discussions. Uh, my wife's the uh, acting commander in Panoka, and they want a unit uh, stationed out of Panoka as well, which would cover if there's a, a shortage or a need to cover our area as well, will help out uh, significantly. Mm -hmm. So that's in the works. Uh, the previous sort of departing uh, detachment commander out of Panoka is now in charge of the uh, RPAC program. So he's well aware of the needs and the, uh, the requirement for our area. So that's good. Uh, that's good for us. Okay. A follow up? Did I answer your question? Please, uh, okay. a follow up. Awesome. Thank you, Reeve. Um, are you finding it to be effective, even though they're covering such yes. a vast area? You're yeah. finding that to be a when, good... When we do call upon them, uh, it takes one of our members uh, away from uh, uh, other duties. Uh, sorry, he used to. Uh, now we can focus on the fact that, okay, they might need an initial response armed officers to de-escalate the situation. Once it's under control and they decide to transport, then my member is relieved and they look after the transport. So yes, 100%. Excellent. I've seen a, a significant increase in even just passing it over to them. And because they have more qualifications than we do, um, we do get the basic training of de-escalating, uh, mental health crisis, negotiation, and things like that. But when you're dealing with somebody who's been in that environment, uh, uh, the, the, those psychosis uh, uh, episodes and are more qualified than police officers to deal and de-escalate with those, the police officers there is in case, I mean, it can escalate very quickly and at the very least, there's an armed officer with that person, whether or not it's a counselor, whether or not it's an RN, psychologist, uh, it's beneficial uh, for uh, the unit as a whole. Yeah, and I would definitely recommend increasing the numbers if we could, if it's possible, if it's something that you can approach the province with. And, yeah. That's something that we can use our advocacy efforts to 100%. help you with. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, do, 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 do. So traffic offenses, I briefly talked about impaired and uh, immediate roadside suspensions. 
Uh, we actually seen an increase of 117% for um, our overall, um, we talked about impaired, IRS, uh, it could be um, dangerous driving, reckless driving, driving while prohibited under a criminal code. One thing that's beginning to tie us up somewhat and also taking up a lot of space is the uh, Firearms Act, Bill C-21. Um, people are told that their farms are now illegal, uh, they're restricted, prohibited, they don't have the proper licensing, and they don't know what to do with it, so they come to the RCMP, um, relying on us to um, take, seize, uh, keep for safekeeping, but it's taking up a lot of space in our exhibit rooms. Uh, I don't know about Rocky, uh, they have a lot more gun uh, related files than we do, but uh, I actually have over 200 firearms in my locker, uh, which is significant for my size of detachment. And it's not necessarily offenses per se, it's just uh, safekeeping, I, I can't t keep those firearms anymore, I don't have the proper licensing, and so on and so forth. And that takes months, and almost like I uh, have a case where that individual is in the process or in the system for almost eight months now to try and get his license renewed. So we have to uh, work around it, I guess. Yep. Search warrants, uh, we've had two successful search warrants on two property. Uh, in addition to Operation Elephant that I will speak uh, briefly after, uh, we've recovered stolen stereo systems, uh, motor vehicles, uh, stitz gear, um, five, six, seven, eight pickup trucks, uh, several vehicles burned, unfortunately, uh, unrecognizable, uh, being able to trace them with uh, auto theft. On November 21st and 22nd, uh, Rimby Detachment participated in Operation Elephant that's been going on for over a year, involving over a million dollar in stolen property. Uh, 30 arrests were uh, completed, uh, four in our area as far as Rimby, uh, but throughout central Alberta, 30, 32 arrests, I believe, in total. Uh, my four arrests in Rimby have been charged. Uh, it's going through the courts right now. So fingers crossed that uh, they're not going to get punted out. And, uh, yeah. Deputy Reed Melhoff, a question? Oh, sorry, thank you. My question was actually with, um, with regards to the uh, Bill C-21. Um, and these were legal gun owners. That's right. Coming to try to stay in compliance with new legislation. Yes, so myself, I own firearms as well that are restricted. As of May 1st, they've become prohibited. So technically, I'm a criminal, according to the law. Uh, now, I'm not gonna carry them, transport them, use them, I can't go to the range with them. Right now, they're a relic above my fireplace and they have to be deactivated so that they can be displayed safely yeah. and not used. So those are thousands and thousands of dollars uh, that are useless sitting there and you know, it's extremely frustrating. Yeah, and it's taking time away from... Well, because uh, we have to, each firearm that comes into our possession, we have to send them to uh, Rocky Mountain House, which is our closest um, firearms expert that has to confirmed that the firearm is not involved in other crimes, so they call them tracing it back to, uh, I guess, the very first time that they left a store and then went from this owner to this owner to this owner, or change hands between criminals to say, okay, it was an armed robbery at the 7-Eleven in Red Deer, for instance, this firearm was involved, and so on and so forth. And then they have to fire test them or test fire them to determine that they actually are an actual firearm that can be used as a firearm to discharge yeah. or uh, fire projectile as per the law. If this goes for prosecution, these are the steps that we need for prosecution. Now, going back to law-abiding citizens, that's not the point. <clears throat> but because they come into police possession, we have to trace them back still, which is extremely time-consuming 
and I believe there's only one farms uh, expert in the yes. so we have two, two now. Okay. It's just about a second trade. Yeah. So it's costly, yeah. it's time consuming. So and takes your officers away from dealing yeah. with actual. So it could be just for issues. instance transporting the firearms from Rimby to Rocky, even if we do a meet halfway, whatever the case might be, we're still tying up either resource on each end. So yeah. Thank you. So we want to, if it's possible, uh, probably try to train one of our members, but then you need to go to the local range with those firearms and you basically lost that member for the shift because he's tied up with a truck full of firearms that he has to test fire and yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not complaining. It's just, it, it is what it is as far as the resources that we have on shift and then, okay, I need to test fire today. I don't know, 15 firearms. Well, it's not going to take the whole day, but pretty close, unfortunately. Unfortunate. Uh, staffing, we're up to full staffing in um, uh, Rimby. So myself, sergeant, one corporal, uh, five constable, plus one additional position. It's called ST, supplemental to establishment. Uh, that person was sent to Rimby in the projection of future transfers, which did not happen because the province was refusing to release uh, some of the members that wanted to leave the province. So now I have six constables, which I'm very happy with, and I put them to uh, work as a, an extra. Um, Support staff, uh, I have three positions, one municipal that's staffed, one CR4 that is staffed, CR5 our office manager that's been vacant because of COVID vaccination requirements, refusal, and unfortunately decided to retire uh, as a result of uh, those requirements. And we just finished the uh, staffing process for it. It took almost six months because of the backlog with uh, PSHR or uh, Public Service uh, Human Resources. And it was uh, extremely painful for us because we only had two uh, supports that because my CR4 is acting uh, office manager right now. So as soon as that's done over with, then we'll see uh, who gets the, uh, the position and I'll have to uh, advertise the CR4 again, if that's the case. I think that's it. Questions, comments, concerns? Uh, Councillor Cermak, please. Yes, can you enlighten me on this new uh, bill? I think it's Bill 5 or 8 that's coming down the provincial on this gun law. They hope to cushion what the federals have given out. It was on the news this morning. Yeah. So Do you know anything about it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so far, <I'm> <laughs> As a I, far I as hope owner, you had something to do with it. Uh, no, I don't have anything to do with it, but uh, very happy to hear that. Uh, what they want is a registry specific to Albertans. So you do have firearms. Uh, as long as you're willing to register them, you'll be able to retain them and keep them and use them. Um, there's still the issue of under the criminal code of having a restricted or prohibited firearm based on the classification that they would be given. As you might be aware, the province is trying to detach themselves from the federal government oversight. So if that happens, then they might be able to legislate their own firearms and classify them based on the uh, Alberta uh, CFO. And if that's the case, then maybe we'll be able to retain our firearms, keep our firearms as a, a, a sportsman, as a a recreative shooter. Uh, I mean, let's face it, the firearms that we seize are illegal because they've modified them, they've reduced the size, they've increased the capacity or the rate of fire. These are still not legal in Canada and nobody wants those firearms. Uh, I got semi-automatic firearms that are restricted, that are not prohibited, but because of that uh, law that was enacted on May 1st of 2020, I became a criminal overnight, literally. Now, they're not coming to your house. Uh, we still need warrants unless there's a emergency uh, measures act that's enacted. Uh, we don't have the authority to do that. 
Uh, but uh, people are still coming in and saying, you know what, I don't want this headache. This is my firearm. Uh, it was uh, passed on to me by my grandfather, uh, grandmother, whatever the case might be, uncle. And I just, I don't want to keep it. I want to get rid of it. So we destroy them. Uh, but before we can just destroy them, uh, we have to do relinquishments of claims. We have to have a firearms application before the courts so that it gets forfeited to the crown. It's quite the process. So maybe this new regulation. There, there might be may there might stop. be some light at the end of the tunnel, but then also depends on who's going to win the elections uh, and whether or not. I mean, at the end of the day, and I could get uh, slaughtered by my uh, uh, my district. Uh, if it's the conservative, they're not pro RCMP. If it's the NDP, um, it's a it's debatable. I guess what could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not pro gun, but the the pool of uh, I guess potential voters is very high for the conservative because they're firearms owners. Yep. So I don't want to speculate, but it looks like it would be the MVP. <laughs> but. You guys walk a fairly tight rope there. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Any additional questions? Oh, if I if I made one more Please. thing, I forgot to. Uh, the priorities that we would like to uh, work on for the upcoming year, which is 2023, 2024, which we call the uh, APPs would be community engagement and relations, police visibility, uh, so increase visibility for us. Property crime still, this is ongoing, it's working, it's effective, break and enter, theft, theft of motor vehicle in general. Traffic safety, it's a priority for me. At the end of the day, if you're speeding and you're being stupid about it, there should be some consequences for it. There's no hips and butts. Um, impaired driving, and we've been getting a lot of flight from police now because people are refusing to stop for police. Now, if we can track them down, if the vehicle is not stolen, we can still go knock on their door and serve them with an, a, a ticket or take them to court if that's the case. So these are the three priorities that we would like to uh, work on. Um, just if you have any questions, concerns, you agree, disagree. I mean, obviously, you'll discuss it after I'm gone and maybe laugh at me. <laughs> I don't know. It's just. Would never. No. <laughs> well, Carl, Carl would tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Carl would tell me. Well, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll turn the floor thank over you. to Ms. Or Sar Staff Sergeant Din Steele, please. Thank you, Reba. Um, so I'll go through the, uh, the same quarterly report that Sergeant St. Pierre went through for Rocky Mountain House detachment. So this is quarter three, so up to the end of uh, uh, December 31st um, of 2022. So uh, this, the report starts out with uh, showing um, ongoing community consultations and engagement that the RCP detachment, that's not all inclusive. Uh, we do actually engage quite on quite a regular basis, both formally and informally. So that uh, that's keeping up and has has gotten easier to do since the uh, the uh, the lifting of restrictions due to the pandemic measures. Uh, as far as community priorities go, uh, ours are uh, first priority is crime reduction, and that's kind of a broad term. Uh, that's crime reduction in all areas, but really prior property crime. Um, in particular, rural property crime uh, is a priority for for the detachment. Um, statistics are still showing property crime down overall, uh, but we're starting to see minute increases in those numbers. And then industry property crime, uh, which is vastly underreported, uh, I think, with our ongoing contacts with industry um, crime reduction groups, we are seeing, you know, uh, incremental increases in, in uh, target, uh, criminals targeting um, oil and gas industry sites. Uh, during that quarter though of 2023, uh, we continued to check on our known prolific offenders on a regular basis. Um, our crime reduction team, that's kind of one of their primary jobs is just to keep tabs on those known prolific offenders. Uh, I've said it a dozen times, I'll say it again, uh, you know, 
90% of the crime committed in our attachment area committed by a known five to 10, you know, people, right? Like uh, probably under 20 for sure. But uh, um, so if we keep tabs on them, hopefully we're keeping crime down. Uh, so they conducted 43 different curfew checks during that period, uh, as well as executing six, 66 warrants uh, for arrest. Uh, they continue to be involved in the preparation of judicial authorizations is just fancy talk for warrants which has resulted in the seizure of illegal firearms, illegal illicit drugs, and stolen property. So the GIS unit was preparing an ops plan for the fourth quarter uh, warrant roundup, which we did complete uh, three weeks ago? Yeah. Three weeks ago. So we had the Central Alberta District crew team, crime reduction unit team in. Uh, we had help from uh, Central Alberta District GIS. We had the ERT team in town. We had um, uh, a couple of dog teams. Air services came and helped us out. And uh, it was a successful week. I think we executed 78 warrants. Yeah, roughly. Um, you know, and really managed to target some of our, 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 our top priorities as far as outstanding. Um, I won't talk about what happened with them after we arrested them and put them in jail because I think they're probably out again. And that's very unfortunate. But um, in that quarter, 21 charges were laid for failing to comply with release conditions as well as 35 further criminal code charges that they were found committing in relation to those checks. So um, a solid quarter for that. Uh, traffic safety, that quarter saw us uh, making 293 violator contacts. Four check stops were completed throughout the, that period. That's not inclusive of the, um, of the uh, JFO check stops for fundraising. I know that that's, you know, we're handing out candy canes and, uh, and, and raising money for the local food banks. However, that visibility is still important, uh, being out there just so that, that the public knows that uh, uh, it's just a reminder and a friendly one that time of year uh, to wear your seatbelts, slow down, uh, get where you're going safe. Uh, overall, so 200 charges were laid in the quarter total in relation to, uh, to traffic safety offenses. Fall and early winter traffic patterns were down from previous year, um, but still it's a primary concern for us. And since then, because of the weather since December, we've noticed a bit of an uptick in, in traffic related, not offenses, but occurrences, lots of collisions uh, occurring uh, because of the weather and, and people not remembering to, to drive to conditions and slowing down. Um, Moving forward into the new year, of course, we're going to have some uh, concentrated and coordinated efforts for more joint force operations with uh, the CPOs for both county and town, uh, as well as the sheriffs and anyone else we can, we can loop into that uh, to get as much visibility out there as possible. Prolific offenders, uh, and that's kind of titled, that's, that should be more about drug trafficking uh, reduction. Uh, there was in the, in the third quarter seven new trafficking investigations. Only one proceeded to charge. Uh, we gathered enough evidence on one of those investigations to take it to charge in that quarter. One, we recommended charges, but the federal crown declined to uh, proceed with them. And then uh, one was still ongoing at the time of this reporting. I think it's still ongoing. It's kind of a running investigation for us. And then four were concluded due to lack of evidence. We just couldn't get the uh, evidence we needed to take them to charge. Uh, our new GIS corporal, Corporal Jim Pelche, uh, he was quick to start uh, increasing um, knowledge for our members by coordinating uh, human source development workshops, uh, intelligence gathering, and this is good because we, we, we traditionally here in Rocky Mountain House have a pretty um, ju um, low average for service. Uh, this is a detachment that a lot of members start at and develop in, so uh, it's good to have that kind of training brought to them and get it while they're here. Um, we also started working with Corporal James McMahon. He's the Central Alberta, Tele Central Alberta District Intelligence Coordinator. He's also a, a gang expert. Uh, so he came to, uh, to work with us as well in developing the, that sk those skill sets behind uh, source development, intelligence gathering, and how to use it in investigations. Uh, the gang identification piece, we're starting to see a little bit of influence from street gangs in, in some areas of the detachment, so that's a concern and we want to raise some awareness about that. Um, a question from uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Sure. Thank you, Reeve. Um, is there anything that we can do to help you with the revolving door that is happening? I mean, it's co it, I mean, that's very off vernacular, but that's what it has been. 
So I, I, I will say this. I mean, we, uh, we're supposed to be impartial about this. Um, we gather the evidence, we put it to the courts, the courts make decisions between the Crown attorneys and, and the judges and the defense lawyers about uh, what that means. Uh, I will tell you that as human beings, we're invested in our work. And uh, we're as frustrated as anyone to see a lot of effort uh, and time put into something and then just not be pleased with the outcome once we send it out our door. And then have to deal with, uh, we are seeing, and I mean, uh, I don't know how, you know, what kind of metric we can use to, to track this, but we are dealing with the same people over and over and over again who have outstanding charges and we see them again and again and again while those, those original charges are still there, yet they're being released again. Because, and I, it, it's very frustrating. Because if you're releasing them, and I know you're innocent until proven guilty, however, there has to be uh, some common sense applied when you look at someone with, uh, you know, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Now, if they have a, if there's their first offense, yeah, sure, you know, I mean, it's they they don't, but if they have a track record that is as long as my arm of criminal code convictions, then. There's a good indication that if we're charging them again, perhaps they pose a threat to public safety and perhaps they should be kept in custody or at least have a reverse onus provision, uh, meaning they have to convince the courts why they should be released on bail versus the current system of where the Crown has to, bears the burden in proving why they shouldn't be released. Uh, and, and the courts are bound, of course, you know, in Canada, courts are bound by, by case law uh, which is, again, you know, um, maybe it's my age showing, but I'm, I'm getting a little disappointed in seeing some of the case law come out of, um, you know, our Supreme Court of Canada, and that just seems to, uh, to have a lot of impact and, and govern decision-making. My personal opinion, um, you know, Crown attorneys and judges uh, in the provincial courts of Alberta um, are just another, another level of civil servant. I mean, they work for Albertans. So if Albertans aren't happy with what's going on in the court system, then yes, you're advocating uh, or sending that message to them is certainly going to be what you can do to hopefully have some impact on how that's going. There's nothing I can do. I, ca I, I cannot criticize the courts. Uh, I, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge. Um, so, you know, I have to sit and accept their decisions. But if you're not happy with it, you have a voice that you can take to the Minister of Justice, the Chief Judge of the Province, the Chief Prosecutor of the Province, whoever you want. They work for you, just like I work for you. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up? Yes, please, and then I'll go to uh, Councillor Rackler. Uh, thank you. Um, you were talking about uh, drug-related offences. Mm -hmm. um, BC has now had a, a little bit of time with their new legislation regarding uh, personal, um, particular uh, opioid narcotic use. Um, have you seen that, with talking with your colleagues in the other provinces, have you seen that to be effective at all or not? I, I haven't had a lot of insight provided by anyone that I know uh, from BC and, and the areas that might be impacted. Sergeant Monroe, is, his whole career up until he came to Rocky Mountain Houses in BC, he might have more information on that or more feedback on these changes. Um, my concern is, uh, you know, the, the decriminalization of, of, of narcotic use or drug use uh, is fine in regards to the, the charges associated with possessing or using an illegal drug. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything to address um, the crimes that are committed to support that drug use. Uh, and that's my bigger concern. Whether or not someone is sticking a needle in their arm is really ultimately a personal decision of theirs, and it's tragic, but, but that's the case. But if they have, if, if, if they are, if their situation or, the, you know, their, their, their circumstances in life don't allow them to hold a legitimate job to support that decision, that means typically um, they're looking to criminal activity to generate the money to support that activity. And those are the crimes that I'm concerned about. That's what drives a huge portion of our property crime issues, is supporting um, addictions issues, methamphetamine use, 
uh, alcohol still a, you know still a, a big one, but um, but meth, and now we're seeing heroin um, back. Oh, I mean, who thought heroin would come back? But uh, there it is. I mean, we're starting to mm -hmm. see it again. Uh, so uh, that's my concern. Um, the issue of personal drug use, yeah, you know, uh, it, it's a crime, and, and I, I would hope that the system versus decriminalizing it would start. They say forcing someone into um, treatment isn't very effective, but the option of going in and obtaining the treatment themselves doesn't seem to be having much effect either. So I'm not sure, you know, where the middle ground is on on that topic. But as far as the impacts of the decriminalization so far, have you heard any feedback on that? The last I heard was, uh, again, the street stuff that they're getting is still cheaper than what they're paying for legally. So they're still going to do it. There's still going to be drug trafficking out there. And again, as uh, staff Dinsdale articulated, it's the, uh, the same crimes are being committed to obtain the funding to get it. Um, break and enters, thefts, everything like that is... They're still doing it to try to get the money. Uh, so it's it, that stuff, the property crime hasn't changed. Uh, just the drug trafficking aspect. Uh, the police are dealing with that in a different manner than they were before. So it's us just having to change the, our approach and how we're dealing with that. As, and that's all these laws are doing is we, we have to revamp what we're doing to operate according to what the laws uh, or what the parameters of the laws are creating for us. Thank you so much. Okay. Councillor Ratcliffe, please. Thank you. Just going back to the uh, judicial system, <clears throat> pardon me, um, a few years ago the courts were so backlogged that the bar for any judicial action was raised quite high. Uh, how much of that has been normalized, shall we say, or you know, what's the is that still a part of it in the issue? There is. There's still uh, dealing with a backlog in the court systems, and and um, uh, there's uh, you know again case law uh, that becomes in effect law upon its law unto itself um, came into effect. Jordan was a decision made uh, four years ago, about four years ago. So the Jordan decision basically put a clock yes. on uh, on criminal matters proceeding to, uh, uh, you know, they had to, once a charge is laid now, a clock starts ticking, and the courts have 18 months to get that charge to disposition. It's a, I think it's longer, I think it's 24 months if it's an indictable, if they go by way of indictment. Mm -hmm. But for summary conviction offenses, which is most of our charges in the courts, they have 18 months to get it done, either to trial or, you know, to plea or whatever. So you're starting to see... Um, the Crown Attorneys taking a look at a lot of these matters and trying to determine whether or not they can get this matter uh, concluded in that 18-month window. Yeah. And if they can't, they're, they're basically saying, then there's no public interest in tying us up in this matter because we have no hope of getting it to, to disposition in, in an 18-month period. Um, Alberta, and I don't know... I'm sure there's been some media coverage on it, but Alberta is moving to a, a process called charge approval, uh, much like Alberta is, or sorry, British Columbia has operated for years and years. Um, so now instead of the RCMP or other police services in the, in the province uh, laying our own, swearing our own information and laying our own charges based on, on the reasonable and probable grounds that we develop in an investigation, um, that's going to the Crown Attorneys. So now we have to complete our investigation, send that information to the Crown Attorneys, and they will make the decision as to whether or not a charge is actually laid. And I think they're doing that as a bit of a gatekeeper to, to slow down uh, and, and decrease this burden um, that the courts have uh, and backlog because our reasonable probable grounds, we read the, the criminal code kind of in black and white. The law is the law, it reads the way it reads, and if we have reasonable probable grounds to believe these offenses have occurred, we will lay those charges. So we may lay a dozen charges on a person in relation to an offense. The, the Crown Attorney looks at it differently. Where is the public interest in pursuing charges here, and what do we have time for? So they'll look at the same case and go, we're going to lay two. We're going to lay two charges here, instead of the, 
you know, the 12 that we have the grounds to lay, there's only public interest in pursuing, you know, the two major offenses because they're going to stay uh, or withdraw 10 of those 12 charges we lay anyway. So um, that's, that's coming this year, apparently. It's the, the process has started where this is going to be the process that we have to do. Changes for us, uh, it's a bit of a paradigm shift in how we conduct investigations because now investigations have to be completed uh, in a much more timely manner because everything has to be ready to go to the Crown before we send it. Whereas now we can start an investigation today uh, we have the grounds to make an arrest. We have the grounds to lay a charge. So we lay the charge, the person gets released. And then we'll have, you know, a month or two before the first court appearance to get some outstanding statements from witnesses, to gather uh, firearms evidence if it, if it requires testing, those kinds of things. But with this charge approval process, it's, it's going to be much, much more rare to have the, the leeway to to provide them with uh, additional disclosure after the fact. Because if they don't see it when it comes time to lay the charge, they may just send it back and say, no, we're not gonna do that. So it's, for us, it's, it's a bit of a paradigm shift um, in, in getting those investigations completed uh, completely. Uh, the pressure's gonna be on to get those done completely in a more timely manner than perhaps previously we, we sort of, we could manage the work over a period of time and now there's gonna be a time crunch to get the work done. Okay. Which around here, because of call volume, becomes a little problematic. If you're taking members off the road to get that work done or just be dedicated to that investigation, the calls don't stop coming. So uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how we adjust to, to that process. And having, having worked in that for the last 25 years of my career, um, as staff indicated, uh, the big thing is, is when members at near the end of their shift get, get something now, uh, they can basically lay it off. You can make the arrest, lay it off until their next shift to be able to finish or complete uh, the stuff that's needed. With this new charge approval, um, everything's going to have to be done then, the complete package. So if you get a, a domestic violence type case uh, near the end of your shift, Everybody that's been involved in it is going to be working on it. So um, uh, what I noticed was for myself working on the road, um, there was a lot of overtime at the end of the shift, a lot of overtime, um, which is going to be one of the things that we're, we're going to notice now is, um, is for the time that the members are sick or whatever, we have to call in extra members. But for this kind of thing, it's just going to increase that, that amount of time being used at the end of shifts. Um, to get that package, the majority of it done. Again, it doesn't have to be completely done, but as staff laid out, uh, the majority of the package has to be done. And then on top of that, we have to let Crown know what's coming up next. So there's also a disclosure to Crown, more information that's going. Thank you. Go ahead, please. If I may add to what my colleagues are talking about, I worked in uh, three previous uh, divisions before uh, we had pre-charge in New Brunswick. So well aware of the system. I hate it with a passion. Uh, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Uh, for smaller units, it's even worse than what he described. Because if I have one or two members on duty, we get a domestic. Now with the pre-charge system, we take a statement from the victim, we take a statement from uh, the suspect, for instance. Uh, we have the uh, in-car uh, video, we have to summarize all the statements. So not only did I sit down for an hour, two hours with the person, taking a nice, complete, thorough statement, detailed, the whole works, I have to summarize it for the crowd. I now have a witness statement. I have to summarize that one as well. Uh, I have to speak to what the onboard camera will show. I have a video. I will be disclosed uh, in a subsequent uh, um, package. No, you have to speak to what that video will speak to. It's extremely time consuming. And like he mentioned, at the end of a shift or something major comes, they're dealing with something that happened on the reserve. Okay, uh, we're dealing with that. It's all good. We have four members that are tied up with this and a domestic comes in. Well, typically it's a two member response. So we'll need their notes. Uh, obviously, 
Uh, we'll need statements and summaries of statements. It's bogging down a small detachment. Now, a bigger detachment, uh, uh, city police, Calgary police, Edmonton police, they will take those members off the road and have them complete that package right away. Doesn't affect the operations, but for us, yeah, it's a whole different ball game. Not a fan. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I, uh, you know, I know that uh, you don't want to be here all day, so maybe I'll. Uh, when we move on to crime statistics, uh, everything across the board is pretty much down. Um, January to December of 2021 versus 2022, the only two places you saw any kind of increase is there's a very small increase uh, in motor vehicle collisions and uh, um, a bit of an increase uh, uptick in those property crimes. But everything else across the board, uh, persons crime, other criminal code, provincial, uh, sorry, criminal code traffic, provincial code traffic, everything's down. So it's a trend we would like to see continue, of course. Uh, you know, the, uh, the sign of, a, of effective um, efforts in crime reduction is, is, is the, are these numbers. So I'm hoping that it's in, in relation to some of our efforts in, uh, in maintaining. So we're seeing this, I mean, throughout the pandemic, we did start to see some increases or decreases just solely because of restrictions that were in place. To see them continuing almost, you know, almost a year into the easing of restrictions, uh, I think speaks to the effectiveness of, of the crime reduction work that, that we're doing specifically with our crew team, just keeping uh, a real uh, close tabs on those prolific offenders. If we can do that, I think this is the results that we're going to see. Um, you know, we want to get to the point where if, if you are a known prolific offender and you are released from custody, um, you're going to get a message from the Rocky Mountain House detachment that you, you have three choices now. You can abide by your conditions. You can, um, you know, break the law and go back to jail, or you can move. That's kind of the message we want to send to these prolific offenders. This is not a place to come and, and, uh, and carry on your, your activities. So hopefully we can get there. Um, Again, uh, much like Rimby, we want to move forward in, in, in increasing our police visibility and presence as much as we can, getting members out uh, of the office, away from those uh, terrible computers and into police cars and visible in the community doing what, uh, what they should be doing. I uh, already talked about our, our efforts to, to be working at more joint forces traffic operations. And then we'll continue our work with the uh, oil and gas industry crime reduction group that meets uh, Monthly, monthly. So, so we're sitting with them and we're working specifically with some security, um, security companies that have been contracted by some of the local uh, energy companies and, and kind of working with them to, to identify. They've got some of their own industry supported uh, crime reduction projects on the go. They have bait property that they put out at some of these sites. So that they, they're starting to work pretty closely with us um, in, 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 in trying to get tabs on, on the offenders that are doing these. And again, these are, these are prolific offenders. This, these aren't one-offs. It's not uncommon to have intelligence gathered where you know, uh, a very distinct vehicle is seen at a dozen sites over a week. Like they're, they're, they're mobile and the big white car typically gives us away. Uh, so they, <laughs> they, uh, they kind of have one up on us for that, but, but we are working with uh, industry to come up with some, we want to work smarter, not harder, uh, in trying to deal with these and, and uh, leveraging uh, technology as, as much as we can in regards to that. Um, and, but it's, it's not as easy as the movies make it, make it out to be. It's, there's always a challenge when you talk about technology helping you out. Um, as far as our, our local staffing uh, numbers, um, we have 17 police officers working in 17 positions. Uh, that's despite having some soft vacancy numbers. Uh, we do have uh, one member on a long-term off-duty sick situation. Um, two members who are technically, they remain on our books, but they're on leave without pay. So they, it doesn't affect us financially. It's just 
an extra body on paper. And then we have one on a graduated to return to work. And then one here that we don't talk about is uh, uh, two years ago when, when numbers were really good for us and uh, uh, we have a, as an employer a, a duty to look at accommodating members if, if they happen to be you know, become disabled or have medical restrictions. We did have that situation, and I did agree to accommodate the restrictions of a, of a member. Um, and we put him to work in, uh, in kind of an administrative capacity. He's our exhibit custodian. He manages our fleet. He looks after our uh, health and safety issues uh, in the office, uh, and really anything else we task him with. He's well worth uh, keeping, um, but... Uh, last year, the town of Rocky Mountain House um, made the decision to ask us to reduce their contract by two positions. So uh, instead of changing their contract, we just agreed to run them vacant. So we have two vacancies on, on the municipal contract, and that's starting to be a little telling, uh, unfortunately. And I don't know how much longer I can accommodate this member's position in an administrative way. So, uh, you know, I don't want to see him out of work. Uh, and I don't want to lose what he provides to the office because if we, if we take him out of there, those duties that he is currently um, completing and keeping him busy on a full-time basis now go back to members as another duty off the side of their desk. Uh, so I would like to keep him, but I cannot keep him in a regular member capacity, I don't think. So I'm, I'm going to explore what it's going to take to create either a civilian member position or a public servant position uh, to maintain his employment. Um, and, and what he does for us. Uh, it's just the, the funding tied to a regular member position, I just, I, I just can't, and I can't absorb not having a regular member position not on the road uh, with that reduction on the municipal side of the house. So uh, that's, that's something that we're going to look at moving forward. Um, and on, uh, we have a CTA agreement with two two of our local Indigenous communities, Sun Child and Ochis. Ochis has uh, done a lot of work. We worked hard uh, to support them in providing as much information as possible um, in, in their approach to the provincial and federal government about renegotiating their, their policing agreement. Um, uh, I think they're going to ask for the moon. I think they, they want a significant increase uh, in the establishment of, of their policing agreement, which would alleviate some pressure from from the detachment and, and the resources that we currently have to provide up there. So hopefully they're successful. Unfortunately, I don't think they're going to see any movement on that until after the provincial election and then three months after that, of course, uh, because no one in the province of Alberta wants to sit down and enter into an agreement right now, not before that election is decided and, and they know what direction they're going to go. Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, as you're aware, the rurals now are entered into police funding model contracts, um, but yet don't sit at those tables when municipal contracts are being discussed, even though we are quite the contributor to the police funding model. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there'll be any opportunity for conversations like that to involve rural stakeholders in the future? I would hope so. I would hope so. I mean, uh, you know, if... if if the province is going to download these costs that traditionally they, they kept at the provincial level to the county level, then, you know, I, I'm not a fan of, of writing checks without knowing where the money's going and having a say in how it's spent. So uh, if, again, this is something that you have to take up with the provincial level ministers and say, well, if we're being told we have to account for this, then we better have a say at that table. I think that was part of the drive uh, with the province of Alberta last year when they, they started talking about uh, um, police oversight and having uh, police governance committees locally. Uh, I think that kind of tied into that concept because that would be your, 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 your constant contact with policing at a local level um, and then feedback to, to the council. But it, it kind of fell off the rails a little bit um, and, and has now gone defunct, the Clearwater County uh, Police Advisory Group. So um, again, I, I think there's going to be more direction from the province after the election. Once that, that election is just a big, it's just holding everything up until 
once it's done. But certainly as a community, I mean, if, if I was a rate payer uh, in Clearwater, I'm a rate payer in the town of Rocky Mountain House, and I certainly, you know, am interested in, in how uh, those monies are spent. So if I was a rate payer in Clearwater County and I was aware that uh, the province is now saying we have to collectively pay a lot more for, for this service, then yeah, certainly it's just natural to think that you would want to have more input uh, or a voice at that table. Absolutely, yeah. Our, our urban partners, like you just had mentioned, can literally say two positions, pull off your books, mm -hmm. and we just get an invoice. We don't get the opportunity to actually sit down and have a conversation yeah. about it. So it'd be nice to be able to do that. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. Um, support staff positions. Uh, we have five uh, public servant positions funded by the, uh, the, the provincial contract. Uh, there is one hard vacancy, however, uh, we are in the process of hiring for that now. And on the municipal side of the house, we have five positions. We just hired the fifth one. So hopefully by late spring, early summer, we will have full complement of support staff in place. Um, and I've, I've talked with the town about this because of uh, the municipal policing service agreement. I'll just make it known here. Um, it is very common practice. Uh, so we do on average of 100, 80 to 100 criminal code, or sorry, um, uh, criminal record checks at this detachment every month. Uh, employers ask for them, um, you know, volunteer organizations ask for them, uh, even landlords ask for them in some cases now. So that is a very busy thing. And each one of those takes about two hours to complete total by the time you take it in, do the work, prepare the documents to give back and give it back. Uh, very time consuming. So uh, it is common practice in many other jurisdictions, if not most, that a charge is being levied for these criminal record checks. And of course, there is, there's uh, caveats in those things. For volunteers, you wouldn't be charged for you know, uh, those you know, special things. But, uh, but if it's for employment or, or education or, or uh, you know, a landlord-tenant agreement act, um, you know, most other jurisdictions charge for these because of the amount of work it takes to complete them, to offset the costs of basically tying up an entire support staff position to do them on a regular basis. So I, I put that to the, uh, the town of Rocky Mountain House for consideration. Uh, I certainly want to let the county know because, um, because a municipal employee is doing it, uh, the town would basically be the ones collecting the funds for it. Although I know that there's some in intricacies about the, the county supports some of the town positions. I'm not sure of the exact details on that. So it would apply to everyone equally and could be applied towards what the, the county funds as well in regards to those municipal employee positions. But just so you're aware that it's, it, it's become a concern because of how often it's being done and, and what kind of uh, workload it puts on our support staff. Um, other than that, uh, quarterly financial drivers, uh, like every other, <laughs> I'm sure the county has felt the pinch of this as well, uh, we've seen operating costs, uh, huge increases uh, associated with fuel and maintenance of vehicles. Um, this is, uh, you know, the fuel prices have not come down as much as we would like, and then uh, parts and, you know, supply of parts for vehicle repairs and maintenance um, is is very frustrating. We've had uh, a Ford F-150 waiting on an engine for a year. Uh, we just cannot get an engine uh, from Ford and they won't let us buy a used one because then the warranty doesn't. It's, it's maddening. Anyway, um, you know, we're, we're working hard to realize efficiencies wherever we can, but there is gonna be some, some increases in those areas of operating budgets. Um, just a couple of other minor points. Our PAC, um, so we talked about the effectiveness of the RPAC team. Uh, they are very effective. They're a very dedicated team. They're, the plan is that in 2023-24 should see a second team coming. Um, again, how funding models and, and, and projected things are going to work out is, is kind of all contingent on that election. But um, the, R, the local RPAC team is, is, is working to the point of being proactive with known clients. We have, you know, we have several known clients that we, we have a history of, of dealing with when they go into crisis, yet it's not, 
it's not uh, concerns that that are that meet the bar for institutionalizing someone. So we're basically stuck with, you know, that cycle of crisis with these people. There, our RPAC team is smart enough to identify these people, look at those histories, and now we're becoming proactive with them. And they're actually going out and just just meeting with them on a regular basis to try and keep keep them level. They're they're doing basically what community mental health services should be doing, but they're doing it because of these clients that are always coming to our attention. So that, that's great to see. Um, we're not seeing the issue with firearms being turned in here um, because of any changes in legislation. I think uh, the federal legislation is just a hot mess and it's very confusing because they, some guns were banned, some are not, but the legislation hasn't passed yet that I'm aware, so I don't think there's any law to actually worry about right now. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, the requirements for testing firearms is a bit of a strain uh, on resources because we do have two local testers. It's become even more so this year. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our long-standing group membership with the Rocky Rod and Gun Club has come to an end. Um, they, uh, they notified us that they can no longer uh, offer us a group membership. Um, their, their, I think, insurance requirements wouldn't allow for it. So basically, we don't have access to a range uh, locally. Um, that means when our firearms testers are doing these testings, they got to drive to Red Deer uh, to access a range. Um, so, you know, uh, I thought I clarified last year with the Rocky Rod and Gun Club that as, as as the RCMP, we, we do not carry uh, liability insurance, but we are indemnified by the Government of Canada. If we are using that range in any capacity that's associated with our duty, if someone gets hurt, if something gets damaged, the Government of Canada will cover those costs. That's our insurance. Uh, and I provided a letter to that effect, but this year it was simply no. We're not offering you a group membership anymore. They did say that we could buy individual memberships, um, but I believe at $150 a membership for 35 members, that becomes pretty uh, pretty expensive. Um, so outside of questions, I won't take any more of your time. Uh, I could talk for a long time. Oh, I, I will end with this. Um, I'm sure it's known. Certainly, uh, uh, Councillor knows that uh, my house has been for sale. Uh, I have been transferred. I'm, uh, I've been transferred to Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan, um, and it looks like the condition will offer to purchase on my house might actually be concluded in the next week or two. Uh, another local couple has uh, decided they need room for their growing family, so I'm, I'm glad. I hope the home blesses them. Uh, and uh, we weren't in a hurry to leave, my wife and I. Um, in leaving now, we almost feel a little cheated in the post because of it being during the pandemic and the restrictions and all those things. We didn't get to know uh, the community or enjoy the area like we would in years past. So uh, we'll certainly be back, but in a camper, not to, not to work. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so uh, on saying that, I, I, I certainly have enjoyed working in Clearwater County. Uh, it's been my honor to, to serve you and um, I know that the town of Rocky Mountain House and perhaps Ochis have expressed some interest in participating in the selection of the next commander. Um, there, there, there are mechanisms that allow for that. So if this is something that the, uh, the you know, Clearwater County would be interested in, in exploring as well, uh, we can certainly make that known to the Central Alberta District. Uh, sometimes there's interviews, sometimes there's just documents provided where you're looking for certain desirable attributes in a commander. I mean, whatever it may be, but uh, th there may be an avenue for that if, if there's an appetite for it. So uh, short of any questions, that's uh, all I have for you today. Um, Deputy Reed Milhoff. Uh, thank you, Reed. Uh, not a question, but I know myself personally, I would love us to be a part of that process. Mm -hmm. um, 12,000 residents, it, it's appropriate that we would be a part of that process, I, I feel. Um, but we've certainly loved having you, and um, I wish I wish you well. And Thank you. Look forward to having you back camping. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, it's 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 bittersweet. Um, it's it's when we transferred here from 
from Saskatchewan. On a map, it didn't look very far. Uh, <laughs> but kids and grandkids and, and an eight or nine hour drive, suddenly it became far. So the opportunity to be closer to kids and grandkids uh, is going to make uh, grandma's heart happy, which will in turn make my heart happy. Um, so uh, it's an opportunity that just the stars aligned. I think Alberta owed Saskatchewan a senior NCO and they said my name and then they offered a bag of pucks too and apparently they took it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, well, certainly on behalf of council, we appreciate the efforts you've uh, you've made over the last number of years to build that relationship. You've certainly been successful with that, and we uh, wish you continued success as oh, you, uh, you as you move away from us, but come back for a visit. For we sure. will. We certainly will. And again, thank you all for your presentation this morning. It was very informative. Um, as always, we, we we like to know what's been happening and uh, and what you're and sharing some of your plans for the future. So, again, thank you for for joining us today. Before I end, and just very quickly, um, there may be more of a kind of a dedicated consultation meeting in the next two or three weeks. Uh, but preliminarily, we're looking at kind of maintaining very similar priorities in, in the year moving forward for our, our performance plan, which would be violent crime reduction, um, traffic safety, and then a reduction in property crime. Um, those are very broad topics, um, and violent crime or the property crime one will probably encompass um, the illicit drug trafficking um, because of how it ties into those things. But uh, while I have you, uh, are there any other issues uh, that you want to see prioritized by the Rocky Mountain House detachment moving into the, the coming year? I'm okay. I go to Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, for me, it's about our priorities at this table and how we can advocate for you mm -hmm. and what we can do um, to try to push the province in the direction that will help with your efforts. Um, and that's why I asked some of the questions that I asked because mm -hmm. it's important for us to work as a team together and we're the ones that go to the province and, and advocate in my opinion, on your behalf yeah. and getting you the help that you need. So that's what I learned here today is how we can go forward and help you by doing a good job on our end and advocating. Well, and I mean, you know, I appreciate that. And I, I, I again, you know, uh, our efforts in, in addressing prolific offenders, um, I, I don't really like the term, but that, that, that catch and release uh, system, uh, you know, if, if there are people, like if, if you can advocate uh, for that kind of reverse onus on bail, like that, that's going to be huge. Like uh, we just spend an incredible amount of time uh, chasing the same core group of people uh, and they're committing offenses while we're trying to get them again. Um, so uh, that'll be important for, for your community and community, you know, and public safety in your community. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do the work regardless, but I, I think at the end of the day, uh, all of our efforts are, are, you know, for hoping, hopefully, keeping citizens safer and 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 their property safer. And um, I think that'll, at least examining it, will be helpful. Thank you. Super. Well, again, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us this morning. I would look to council for a motion to receive the 2023 to 2024 RCMP annual performance plans and delegations as presented today. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe, please. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I call that question. All in favor? And that is carried. Super. Uh, we'll take a 10-minute break here. Be back at 10:30. Uh,
Welcome back everyone after our recess. We move through our agenda today and we move on to item uh, 5.1, the 2022 assessment data report. And we're joined by uh, our manager of assessment, uh, Mr. Rob Cotchen. Please, uh, please go ahead and outline your item today. Uh, thank you, Reed Lohit. Um, I'm here to present the updated data for the county. And uh, we'll start in, with some basic uh, information on how the assessment's working. So our valuation date each year is July 1st. Uh, our 2022 values that will be reflected in this year's uh, notices uh, in, uh, are influenced by all the property sales within the county from July 1st, 2021 up to July 1st, 2022. So these market sales have resulted in significant increases in our overall assessment values for the county. Now the values also increased due to growth in new construction projects throughout the county. Uh, 2023 saw rising interest rates, slowing growth, but overall our assessment values are still increasing. Um, the delays of three to four months in land title registry are causing issues uh, throughout the province. So uh, these values, uh, the, the titles that are happening now, even just doing last month's titles, I'm still seeing that three to four month delay. Um, even though these titles are coming in in February, I'm looking at the, uh, the dates that they were signed and they're signed still in 2022. So our assessment process, uh, properties often contain multiple codes such as farmland, residential, non-residential or exempt status. The values are determined by a mass assessment based on the market sales. So our provincial audit standard sets parameters for the median assessment ratio to achieve an average between 95 and 105 percent uh, based on those sales. Uh, we submitted our 2022 assessment roll uh, February 23rd this year for initial review and the auditor has determined that we've met the assessment quality standards. Now our assessment data is used as the basis in determining our property tax rates. Now the assessment year is always one year prior to the taxation year. Therefore, we'll be comparing the 2022 assessment data with 2021 data. Uh, the 2022 assessment data will be used as the basis in determining the 2023 property tax rates. Now our total taxable assessment base has increased just slightly over 9%. All market sectors have had this increase in 2022. Uh, in 2018, our municipality contracted with Accurate Assessment Group to assist us in the valuation of the designated industrial properties, or DIPS, as we uh, acronym that we use, which is, are mainly located on the provincially owned crown lands within our county. Now, AAG is contracted to inspect and record the changes that occur each year. Our contract with AAG has been extended until uh, it's going to be extended just till the end of this month, March 31st of this year, at which time the province will take responsibility for all assessment work for the, these DIP properties. So here in general, in, in the numbers are laid out for you and you can see across the board in, the, in our change uh, category there that the percentages are all in the black. And uh, so the totals when we look at the 21 total value versus the 2022, you see an increase of $650 million approximately. And that increase is uh, reflected in about $450 million coming from our linear and dip properties, and then another $200 million from our uh, residential and business properties. Um, I'm just going to go, I'll go through this uh, presentation and then I'll take any questions you have at the end, if that's all right. So the linear property consists of wells, pipelines, and electric power generation, telecommunications, railway, and cable distribution. Now all these assets below ground are included in the linear assessment values, and the province provides these values to us each year. Now DIP properties are defined as land and improvements and facilities regulated by Alberta Energy Regulator, National Energy Board, or the Alberta Utilities Commission. The province decided to tender out the DIP assessment function for the larger municipalities such as ourselves. 
Now the tender process closed in January of this year and we were informed that our current contract assessor, AAG, won the bid to continue providing service to our county. So this will provide continuity for the future as AAG will now contract directly with the province uh, beginning April 1st of this year. And the, the linear and dip property values make up approximately 73% of our total assessment base here. Provincial tax incentives and higher oil prices have triggered significant new oil and gas activity which increased the assessment value over the prior year. The 2022 increases in dip and linear do not include assets that qualify for the provincial three-year tax vacation or tax holiday on new wells and pipelines. Uh, this incentive applies to the assessment years 21, 22, and 2023 for the tax years 2022 to 2024. So we're in our second year of the tax holiday assets and the province has given us an accounting of this and, and they're currently valued at $396 million for the two years 2021, 2021 and 2022. Now this value is will become taxable will, in 2025 along with whatever value we receive uh, whatever activity happens in the 2023 assessment year. Um, we also have a small business assessment subclass which was uh, introduced in December 2019 and allows council to create a separate tax rate for our local businesses and for the 2022 assessment year, we have an increase. Of, we have 191 roles now with a total value of $68.7 million qualified for the small business status. And this is an increase from the 2021 year where we had about $56 million in assets for small business. And we continue to inform and encourage any new business, businesses that we become aware of within the county to apply for this benefit. And the qualifi qualification factors are just to have a valid county permit to operate here and also to have less than 50 employees. So in conclusion, you can see significant uh, increases in our residential and business property. Uh, oil and gas industry continues to develop new projects in our municipality. And this is reflected in the increases we see in our dip and linear property values. And Overall, this will give us uh, a higher assessment base to work with for 2022. Uh, are there any questions? Questions? Uh, go, uh, go ahead, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, the 10.13% residential increase. Um, that's, I just want to confirm for, to ensure that I'm understanding this uh, properly, um, that's an increase in the actual assessment value of existing properties, not necessarily a reflection of 10% more people or residences, et cetera. I just want to make sure I understand that it's assessment value, not necessarily people and new homes. Yes, this, this is strictly the assessment values. So basically the sales that we have year to year, all the similar type properties. So whether it's an acreage property, whether it's farmland property, any type of property that contains uh, residential uh, buildings on it or, and is assessed as residential, there, there's an overall increase like total from the 2021 year of about of 10%. So uh, now that's not gonna be reflected in, like in, in, on average, we're gonna have a range of increases for all the people in the county. Some will have higher, some will have lower, but that is the overall average just based on the sales that have occurred in that one year. Well, we do a three year running average. So we're always dropping like the oldest year and picking up the newest year. So that newest year of 2021 to 2022, that, that, that's the change there 10% uh, for that one year. But overall, you're not gonna see everybody in the county have their assessment values go up by that 10%. There's gonna be a, 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 an average, a range of, of values that'll increase, but more by and part, all residential, all residents within the county are going to see some type of increase in their assessment value. Thank you. Um, follow up? Or no, sorry, there's um, other people. And, yeah, let, and we will come back to you. Uh, Councillor Swanson, please. I'm curious, because um, we have this increase for 2021 to 2022, the pr two years prior, because you said we, we have that average over, whereas it, 
I, remind us, has, has it, was it going up as well? And is this just a, a point in time in, in, in this trend or is, will there be a follow that could happen potentially in the years to come? Look, when we're looking at the three year average, the first or the two oldest years were very flat, but they were still on an upswing. And then since I've, I've uh, so from July 1, 2022, up to the current time, I'm still seeing a, a, an increase well, or a flattening. Like we, we were kind of on a, like that one year, it just happened to be a perfect storm of, you know, low interest rates, um, great, great demand and, and just great act, sales activity within the, the county for that one year. But overall, it's going to average out to like a lesser amount going forward. I'm expecting the 2023 a, a assessment will is showing a, a flattening, so it's not going to be to the same degree as we see this year, but there's still going to be some type of increase when we do the, the three-year average, like once we drop that old year and pick up the newest year. Councillor Ratcliffe, please. Thank you. This might not be quite the right place to ask this question, but um, I, I'm wondering how this increase in assessment will impact um, residential taxes, well, taxes in general. Um, when, when the finance manager, Rhonda, brings in, in April, she'll be bringing you a, a, an assortment of uh, tax scenarios that will, uh, you, you will, you know, the council will decide on how much uh, of an increase or, or how, what, you, what the change in tax rates are going to be and how much that will affect uh, the, the 2023 mail out that we do in May. So that's totally up to uh, council on how you want to uh, treat the assessment base uh, increase. Um, I mean, theoretically, if you kept the, the rates the same as the prior year, you're still gonna have a, a significant increase in revenue to, to work with. So that's something that'll be up, up to your, up to council. Okay, yes, thank sir. you. I look for, forward for that when yes. you're ready. Ms. Zerhan? Yeah, just a couple of uh, clarifying items. So even though the t um, residential um, assessment value is increased by 10%, um, that's not just um, existing residences. There are um, new residences that are being added also. So even if it's somebody moving from the town of Rocky into Clearwater County and they're building a house, that adds to the residential assessment. So um, not everyone will see a 10% increase in their municipal tax because uh, their assessment value is averaged, gone up 10%. No, um, there is some growth in the values, but there's also some growth due to new uh, assessed properties. So it's, a, it's a, um, a combination of those two things. Um, also, um, what someone's tax bill looks like in the end. There's also um, the requisition for the Westview Lodge and there's the school requisition, both of which, um, neither of which we have yet. Well, I got a preliminary look at the provincial school requisition. It looks like it's actually decreasing slightly, um, but I'll, like um, Mr. Gotchin said, I will be bringing back the um, rates and how um, the current rates applied to the new assessment, um, what that effect that has on the tax revenue moving forward. Thank you. And I'll go to Deputy Reeve Milhoff for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, large, our large urbans in this province are wanting to see ag assessment um, or ag taxes based on their actual assessed value. Um, I'm assuming that these are based on the regulated values of the $350 per acre um, non-irrigated -ir um, and 450 irrigated. Um, what would those numbers look like if the urbans were successful in making it so that we have to base it on assessed value and how <coughs> detrimental could that be to our ag community? Um. Well, I know that $350 an acre couldn't buy you any farmland at this point in time. I mean, so the, the actual, what, what I'm seeing in the marketplace when, the, when farms are, are transferring now, just vacant quarters for say, 
uh, they can range for like half a million dollars for, for a vacant uh, quarter section. So that you're looking at like 3,000 an acre. So you're looking at 10 times uh, regulated value versus current market value approximately. So I wouldn't even venture a guess on how much that could change uh, someone's tax rate. That would be a huge, uh, such a huge increase. I don't think the province could, or I mean, I, I don't imagine that'd be a very popular uh, <laughs> policy change within Alberta. But uh, I just know that like the actual current market value of farms transferring within Clearwater, uh, so like I say, is approximately 10 times uh, what our current assessments are showing. So uh, I don't know if that's a political hot potato, if that's someone, something somebody would want to challenge or try to take on, but um, that would be a very uh, difficult thing to, to move forward with, to go directly from the current regulated rate to, to, to value. Um, but that's just giving you uh, approximate parameters of where current value is versus that regulated rate that they were, were currently mandated to use. So that's that's the MGA. So that would require a change in legislation, and I'm not sure. Uh, you know, politics are always unknown, and and what where they want to what what policies they want to change. But I think that one would be a, a difficult sell to. Alberta residents. Yeah, it's a very scary thing and I just want to make sure that we know how it can affect us so that we can be armed to advocate on behalf of our ag community. Yeah. And Mr. Hagan, please. Thank you, Reeve Lawheed. I just wanted to add as well a reminder that even if such an event did occur, this council would still have the authority to set the rate. So it wouldn't necessarily be the same tax rate that uh, property owners are seeing today. Council could decide to adjust the rate to, to compensate for that to whatever degree council saw necessary. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Cermak and then to Councillor Swanson. Okay, on, on the tax holiday, you referred to $396 million for the last two years. And then we can start getting tax from these people after the third year? That, that's correct. So the, the yep. province started this three-year tax holiday in 2021. And they're tracking these assets separately. So they're giving us the taxable amount of these asset, uh, of linear assets. And then they're, they're keeping these ones separate for all new uh, oil well and pipeline activity. So next year would be the third year of the holiday. So then we'll have those three years, uh, 2021 to 2023 assessment. And so they wouldn't be taxable at 2024. It would be the following year. So you're looking at the 2025 um, calendar year or tax year where that would become, uh, be added to the current amount uh, of linear and dip property that we have. Gee, so that amount then, this is there. Does their tax work the same as our land tax that you can depreciate it over? I believe so. 10% but depreciation? I, I believe so, but I believe the, the amounts that the province are giving us are reflecting depreciated value already. So like the first year, the 2021, the, that amount is depreciated to a certain extent and then added to the 2022 amounts. They've just given us the total amount. Okay. I haven't uh, checked. And, and looked at any details yet just because they've, they've separated it out and they value they value all that land uh, property for us so we're, we're not involved in the valuation process we just take what the province gives us um, after the third year I can we can do some more I'll, next year when I come in I can do some more digging and and get some more details on how that tax holiday assets are going to be look or uh, treated by the province okay thank you and Councillor Swanson, please. You've kind of led into, I was going to ask you about next year in regards, because I'm looking at the substantial increase, or I shouldn't even say substantial, the 9% increase. And I'm thinking of Nordeg with the addition of the residents and then uh, additional lots that we've got coming on board, plus the potential of the commercial lots being for sale this year too. So that could potentially increase, uh, or that could be, you know, have an effect on our uh, assessed value for next year too, correct? Yeah, all, all property in Nordic, it, uh, the, the property values are, are shocking me on how much they're they're going up. Like for 
Uh, and then with the new, like I believe we sold out the first phase already of the Elizabeth Avenue lots. Um, and with the second phase under construction and I'm, I'm anticipating getting that subdivided, uh, the 26 commercial parcels that are gonna be in because we're, we're having meetings actually uh, to determine final pricing on those lots. So I, I don't, I expect to see sales of those lots also. And we're, we're also, I think we sold out half or over half of the uh, mobile home, the new Nordeg mobile home lots also. So there's strong demand in Nordeg and uh, I see continued demand uh, uh, going forward, especially once uh, some more commercial businesses get established with these new lots we're bringing online, I expect uh, Nordic just to continue to grow. Thank you. Any additional questions? Well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Councillor Swanson, go ahead. I was just gonna make the motion. Okay, perfect. To accept uh, the 2022 Clearwater County Assessment Data Report for information. Discussion on that motion. Seeing none, I call the question. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much for joining us and, and thank you for your report. Thank you. That takes us uh, down the agenda to item uh, 6.1. Um, this is uh, an item relating to the installation of cattle guards, a request coming in from a repair. And I'll uh, turn, turn the, the um, floor across to our team from uh, Public Works. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Reeve Lougheed, Deputy Reeve Malhaf Council. The first agenda item is a request for the installation of cow guards on the Burnstick Lake Road. To assist Council in the recommendation as given, I will turn it over to Sean, our engineering intern, who will provide the necessary background. Upon completion of Sean's presentation, administration will turn it over to Council for further discussion and debate. Go ahead, Sean. Thank you. Good morning, Council. On September 27, 2022, Ms. Patty Scott submitted a reading letter to Clearwater County requesting that the county install cattle guards on Birthday Lake Road at both the north and the south end to the boundary of her grazing lease. This letter is attached. Further to the request, Ms. Scott would enter into a long-term maintenance agreement with Clearwater County that would include hiring a vacuum truck to remove any residue in the cattle guard catchment area. A map of the related Birthday Lake Road area is attached. As shown on the map, Birthday Lake Road cuts the land of the reference forest grazing lease into two parcels. Among the Birthday Lake Road, the west boundary is 5.72 kilometers and the east boundary is 6.48 kilometers. Currently, Clearwater County has two policies that reference cattle guards. The first policy is the use of road right of way policy. Specifically, Section 6, generally cattle guards will not be permitted on road, uh, on road allowance. In the cases where a cattle guard is approved, it will be at the applicant's expense. The applicant will be responsible for the installation and the maintenance of the cattle guard. If in the municipality's opinion it is not being maintained, it will be removed at the sole cost of the applicant. The second policy is the informational science policy. Specifically, Section 7, the cost of the stock at large signage will be the responsibility of whoever installed the cattle guard. Administration also did a policy review of cattle guards or Texas gates from eight other municipalities. This is attached in the agenda item for your review. It is stated in some of these policies that the applicant is liable for any and all damages sustained by the public if proper maintenance and repair are now done. Administration would also reach out for legal consultation to see if the county could be protected from these liabilities, if it is council's wish to move forward with this request. Among provincial regulations, the Street Animals Act, more specifically Part 1, Liability for Trespassing Livestock, Section 5 and 6 may be applicable to this case. WSP conducted a traffic, traffic count on the Birthday Lake Road in 2020 and 2021. And the following is a summary of the data. 
In 2021, the average daily traffic count from June 30th to July 6th was 199 vehicles per day. 20% of the total vehicles were heavy trucks. In 2020, the average daily traffic from September 26th to October 2nd was 138 vehicles per day. 11.9% of the total vehicles were heavy trucks. For trails in the related birthday Lake Road area, no provincial trails are found. However, we recognize that unofficial trails may exist. For example, a map of the Clearwater Trail Initiative is attached. <coughs> Section G is the information regarding feral horses. In year 2021, Alberta Environment and Parks conducted a feral horse minimum count. The attached map shows a record of the feral horse in the related Burst Lake, Burst Lake, Lake Road area. To further explain this map, a brown dot on the map represents a herd of feral horses. More detailed information about that specific herd is listed in the red box above that brown dot. As you may see on the map, a number of feral horses are visiting this region. However, one thing to note is that while many of us use the term well to refer to feral animals, generally speaking, the term feral more accurately describes domesticated animals that have escaped domestication. A feral animal may be an individual domesticated animal who is no longer in a domesticated environment or one of their descendants. Section H shows the current payment schedule. In the current 10 year capital per budget, it is budgeted to perform grading in 2025 and paving in 2026 on Birthday Lake Road from the first Birthday Lake campground access to the northeast to the end of the pavement. This section of the road is roughly 5.2 kilometers in length. Once paved, it will be around 6.0 kilometers of gravel road from the new pavement to the first north cattle guard requested in Miss Scott's letter. For the past history of the cattle guard's installation, in June 2017, Clearwater County approved to install a cattle guard on undeveloped road allowance with the following conditions. The first is if undeveloped road allowance is ever developed, it must be removed at the applicant's expense. Second, Clearwater County will not be responsible for the maintenance of the cattle guard. Third, safety and maintenance of the cattle guard is the sole responsibility of the applicant. In addition, bylaw number 172-89 uh, was tabled in 1989. However, it was defeated at the first reading. Currently, there are 35 cattle guards within Clearwater County. Clearwater County inspects and maintains these cattle guards on an annual basis. These cattle guards were inherited by the county from the province of Alberta when the county was incorporated in 1985. No cattle carts have been installed by the county ever since. The last section, J, is about the cost to install cattle carts. As per the aforementioned Clearwater County's policy on use of road right of way, in the cases where a cattle guard is approved, it will be at the applicant's expense. The applicant will be responsible for the installation and maintenance of the cattle guard. If, in the municipality's opinion, if it is not being maintained, it will be removed at the sole cost of the applicant. So here is a breakdown into the cost of installing cattle guards. I will break it into three categories. So the first is to purchase cattle guards. A 9.145 meter cattle guard will be required for this road. The cost to fabricate a non-engineered one is $6,450. And an engineered standard heavy type cattle guard will be $28,134. Based on Alberta infrastructure and transportation specifications, this engineered standard highway uh, cattle guards are suitable for both paved and unpaved roads and they are designed to carry any legal heavy vehicle at, at various speeds. Considering the large volume of the traffic on Birthday Lake Road, engineer cattle guards will be needed. Second, for installation fee, the, install, the installation cost is at the very least a couple thousand dollars per cattle guard. The installation time will be around one to two days per cattle guard. Third is the repair and maintenance cost. Depending on the severity of the repair, Repairs to one cattle guard can be anything from 
$500 to more than $1,500. For the maintenance cost, historically speaking, to clean out of a cattle car with a vacuum truck, it cost the county from $2,400 to $5,100. So as a conclusion for staff's recommendation, that council considers Ms. Patty Scott's request that Clearwater County fabricate and install cattle guards across the birthday lake road at both the north and the south boundary of the grazing lease, along with the condition that Clearwater County enter into a long-term agreement whereby Ms. Patty Scott would conduct any maintenance and or repairs to the cattle guards. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? Who wants to start? Councillor Graham. If we were to install these cattle guards, what would that do for load restrictions on that road for big trucks? Uh, as indicated by Sean, the route we would have to go is the AT uh, specified engineered cattle guards. So that would not inhibit any type of load restriction. They, those cattle guards would be able to accommodate all uh, vehicular traffic including heavy loads. So, so a question I might have, that, that number was stated as $28,134. Is that including installation? No, it does not. So there that would is, be additional costs to that as well? That it? is correct, okay. yes. Thank you. Um, who was next? I'll go to Deputy Reeve Melhoff and then to Councillor Rapp. Uh Thank you, Reeve. How many um, cattle allotments not leases, because leases are responsible for being fenced themselves, but how many cattle allotments are in Clearwater County? Are we potentially opening ourselves up to building um, these cattle guards on any number of the allotments that are within Clearwater County? I'm going to turn that over to uh, Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin, please. That's a good question. Um, in Clearwater County, we have about 100,000 acres of provincial grazing land or grazing lease allotments, head tax permits, dispositions. Um, there's different ways the province makes that land available. Um, but for our, from discussion purposes, you know, the industry calls them crown grazing leases. So 100,000 acres of crown grazing lease, significant amount of this grazing lease is accessed by Clearwater County Road, which means it's adjacent or dissecting. That would make it desirable for producers. Um, uh, if you don't have to maintain and install fence, um, that is something a lot of producers would look at, you, you know, in their scenarios. We do have some grazing lease that's only accessed by oil and gas, and, and a lot of them are using cattle guards for um, um, access. A lot of times the oil and gas prefer that method because there's not gates and things to open on their infrastructure. So. Um, and of course, oil and gas roads are not regulated under the Highways Act and, you know, there's a whole lot of differences. There's more differences to those roads than similarities. So to answer the original question, I do believe there would be dozens, if not more, producers that might be interested in a cattle guard, um, maybe not initially, because all of our fences are in varying degrees of repair right now. So when, you know, we have, you know, say a couple miles of, of fence that needs to be replaced, we'd be looking real hard at this if this um, was something the county was going to consider um, for, you know, really all producers in the future. Typically when council does something for one, they, they're generally prepared to do it for all. You know, that's that's typically now. Of course, it's your decision to, to make one-off decisions if you wish, but um, in my <coughs> recollection history, those, you know, are, are not often. Council usually makes policy for, for the entire industry, so... Yeah, pretty much the whole, you know, western side of our county has, you know, grazing lease uh, along it as it gets into the vacant land. Thank Hope you. that answered the question. Yep, dozens. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. How many grazing leases does this issue uh, concern? Is, is it all one? I, I'm coming from the point of why there would be a road through the middle of one lease. So in this is instance, the producer has grazing lease on both sides of our road. That's not uncommon. Um, um, lots of producers have grazing lease on both sides or another common instance is deeded land on one side, grazing lease on the other. 
most of us operate our land the same. You know, whether it's rented, grazing lease, or owned, we run it, manage it the same way, incorporate it into our farms. So in this instance, um, the producers have land on both sides of the road, and um, this would make it easier for them to, to utilize uh, both sides of the road. And, and that is a common scenario um, throughout the county where we have producers with land on both sides. Okay, so are they separate leases though on, on each side of the road? Yeah, I don't know that specific. Um, it really doesn't matter necessarily. I don't think, you know, from the producer's perspective, nor do I think that would affect the county's decision. That's really more of a administrative function from how the government of Alberta administers that specific um, access mechanism to the grazing lease. Um, so I don't know if that uh, question offhand. In a lot of instances, it would be separate. Um, now, uh, without knowing this specific instance, I can't say that for sure. And Councillor Swanson, please. I'm referring to this map uh, in regards to what is ex what is fenced existing right now. So if the ask is for cattle guards on the north and south end of that particular road, is there fencing anywhere else within the perimeter of that? Is it just the perimeter? Or is it the internal? Is Where's the existing fence lines in that for that grazing lease? So from the best of our knowledge, and, and uh, Matt, if he wants to contribute as well, is there currently is no fencing uh, along the roadway itself. Uh, I'm uncertain as to whether or not uh, this individual, Ms. Scott, has fenced any other portion of her grazing lease. So I would suspect probably not. It will be fenced on the north and south borders because that's where they'll be adjacent yeah. to other land. So what, what I'm assuming this producer would do um, is they'll tie those north and south uh, fences into those cattle guards. So you do have a requirement to keep your cattle away from uh, adjacent cattle. So she'll accomplish that or that producer will accomplish that with, with north and south boundary fences. So there will be a, a, a bit of fencing that the producer will have to do to tie into those cattle guards to mean that the cows won't walk down the roads north and south to access um, uh, other people's livestock. And then that would put her um, in non-compliance with their uh, grazing lease requirements. Um, so, um, but uh, Director Magnus is correct. There's no fencing right now adjacent to the road, but there is on, on the north and south boundaries um, to uh, um, keep the livestock on their property. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I'll go to uh, Councillor Northcott for a question. Yeah, absolutely, that, that, I had that question too, Councillor Swanson, was if there was perimeter fencing around the, the grazing lease itself. <clears throat> and. Uh, has there, any, has there been a history of any uh, accidents or livestock that's been hit on that Burnstick Lake Road because of livestock being on the road? That, that, is anybody aware of that? Mr. Martinson? I don't think the county's specifically aware of that. It's likely that we wouldn't be notified. Uh, that's a property issue between the livestock owner and the, the insurance company that hit it. Um, and so it, it is common. Um, I hear about it. Uh, a little bit from now and then on oil and gas roads and things like that. So uh, uh, without us having a specific example, we can't refer to anything, but it happens. You know, just like um, deer are hit. Um, cows often will lay on roads to fight flies and to um, get the coolness of the road or the warmth of the road. So, you know, it's, it's common that the cattle get hit on roads, you know, oil and gas roads, uh, public roads. Um, it, it happens now whether we would find out about it or not um, sometimes unlikely yeah, I know it's just a fairly high grade road and I know that it's a fairly active <clears throat> road and if if that was to be fenced if there was to be fences run along the Burnstick Lake Road who would who would financially pay like who would pay for that fence who's would that be the leaseholder yes that would be at the cost of the leaseholder Cape, and then for if there was to be access for ATVs and stuff like that, there could be, uh, you know, smaller, I suppose, temporary crossers for ATVs to be able to, like, cross the fences and stuff. There wouldn't have to actually be gates, but along that road, there could be, uh, you know, ATV crossing cattle guards installed, right? 
we have grants actually that that work with uh, um, uh, livestock producers in these areas, um, um, and so we have a, an engineered uh, uh, spec uh, on a on a over the fence crossing that um, that will provide grant funding towards um, to have constructed, um, and so that's something we'd be. Uh, willing to work with really any producer in that area or or really along our west side where we have that conflict between recreation and, and grazing livestock. Thank you very much. And before I go to um, Deputy Reed Melhoff and then to Councillor Graham, this really opens up my biggest concern with this. If we entered into an agreement with a leaseholder, um, would there not be some shared responsibility or liability when that inevitable collision between cow and car happens? Um, definitely, I, I'm, I'm a, a little hesitant to, to even understand how somebody could, uh, could have that level of liability insurance to allow livestock to run free on a, on a, on a community road. Um, Anyway, uh, maybe you can shed a little light uh, on that. I'll start and then I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Martinson as well to contribute. Um, so we provided council with a summary of eight other municipalities in regards to what they do and how they manage this. And I'll just provide a bit of a summary and then Matt can uh, add to it here as well. So in looking <coughs> at those eight municipalities, basically it's uh, installation of a cattle guard is broken down into four um, uh, areas. One, A, uh, at the installation of the cattle guard is at the discretion of council on a case-by-case -case basis. B, uh, again, installation of cattle guard or, um, or any new installations are not permitted, so they're just all right, don't do it. Um, and I'll come to this in just a minute again, come refer back to this particular point. If a cattle guard is permitted, all costs, including the purchase, installation, and maintenance, is the applicant's responsibility. Uh, finally, and um, uh, here's uh, a bit of the uh, kicker to this, is the application, applicant shall carry liability insurance. Um, now, according to the Stray Animals Act, it does indicate, uh, simply put, and we did refer to it, and in the summary it states as if the livestock cause any damage to personal property while in the process of trespassing, if not fenced in, the owner of the livestock is liable. And of course, Clearwater County would be liable as well. Uh, we would not be exempt from any type of lawsuit. I mean, there's, there can always be lawsuits given, right? That's, that's at the onus of the individual or the property being damaged. Um, they're going to go after everyone and anything. That would be Clara County as well. I'll turn it over to Matt. Mr. Yeah, and so the Highways Act does permit livestock on a right away. And as um, Director Magnus mentioned, um, the council could permit under the Highways Act for livestock to graze. And there's lots of areas where provincial roads, trunk roads, a good example. Um, so by doing that, it doesn't necessarily open us up to liability per se, um, because often we're liable for things that we do, not things that we don't do. And, and you know, they're not our livestock. So it, it, is there more moral liability? Sure. You know, because we are sending vehicles down this road at 80 kilometers an hour, knowing that there could be cattle for these eight, eight miles. Um, and, you know, um, weighing the benefits of, to the producer to do this, versus the potential drawback to the, to the traveling public, that's the moral liability, I think. You know, does it open it us up to a little more financial liability through lawsuits and stuff? Sure. You know, anything we do potentially does. Um, from the Stray Animals Act, if the council authorizes this, the, the livestock would no longer be tr trespassing on the highway, so they wouldn't be um, necessarily liable if a vehicle hit cattle. The signage was up. It's no different than deer. Um, where where it gets dicey is, again, the farmer's not necessarily liable for something that you know that they didn't do unless they should have done it. So if I can, if I hit a, if I hit Councillor Melhoff's cow, I can prove that that cow uh, had hoof rot, and Councillor Melhoff ought to have treated it. 
um, that way it would have got off the road quicker. Now, Councillor Melhoff's liable because she ought to have treated that cow. That's part of, you know, if I just hit a cow on the road because I didn't see it and it popped out of the ditch, now we're fighting it out, you know, and, and yeah, you know, it, it certainly adds, you know, trouble to that producer because there's deep pocketed people that will, will go for a fight regardless. Um, but that's the producers, you know, their liability will cover that. My experience with liability insurance, if, if you use it, your company drops you. So the first time you get sued, they'll, they'll cover that, but you'll never get insurance through them again. Um, you know, and that's, that's troubling, but that's a, that's an individual producer and industry issue sort of thing. And, and those things can happen, you know, even when we're not grazing on a road. So, um, I think, you know, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense on what that looks like, but yeah, I think overall we're going to see, you know, a potential for, for, for more something here. Um, but again, that's that balance between, you know, supporting agriculture, having safe roads, you know, um, that's, that's why these things come to, for you folks to, to consider. And I'll go to Deputy Reeve Melhoff and then Councillor Graham and then back to Councillor Sermon. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I recall a few years ago during a drought where um, previous council made a decision to allow for um, right-of-way grazing just to allow for animals to actually graze on the right of way. Um, so do we not normally allow for grazing on our right of way and therefore this road right of way should not be grazed in the ditch anyway and potentially opening it up, putting cattle guards makes it so the road right of way will be grazed in against a different policy? So I think previous council discussed it a bit. We don't have a formal policy or bylaw um, that, that enables it or prohibits it. So. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, the Highways Act allows for livestock, so it's sort of default allowed. Um, where we where we would address it is if it's uh, wrecking our 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 right away, uh, causing disturbance, you know, uh, um, affecting drainage. But we see it from time to time every year where folks will graze the the right away either on a controlled moving graze. We have some producer that does that on timing with sheep where he'll move his livestock up one side and down the other for grazing and then we have others that will just throw electric fence up you know um, we try to recommend we keep that to the ditch bottom um, not up on the shoulder and you know we monitor it and if they're not causing uh, uh, impacts to the road or the ditch then we allow it um, but we haven't done anything formal um, 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 one way or the other Okay. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Graham, please. I just want to clarify, because in the letter it has that the county has to provide the um, rangeland archaeologist or Alberta Parks or whoever is making the farmer do this. <coughs> um, we have to provide them with a letter or we have to grant livestock permission to roam freely and then B is to do the cattle guards is that a boat we have to do both those things or could we just do the letter that they can roam freely without the cattle guards from my understanding we would be committed to both A and B okay thank you and Councillor Cermak thank you Eric. <clears throat> I understand that this lady has had this grazing lease for quite a number of years is there any grandfather stuff that when she acquired this that she had the right of way to graze the, the Burnstick Lake Road? No, no. And that's why the uh, um, Ag and Forestry representative, the rangeland agrologist, will be looking for our permission to do this. Otherwise, if we don't provide permission, then they will require the fencing. Okay. So there is no... Um, LOC or anything of that nature that suggests we have to provide this. Um, it's, um, it's wholly up to this council whether this uh, uh, ask is granted or not. Okay. Follow up. Um, please, and then I'll go to Councillor. Um, if she was to pay for these expensive cattle guards and, and do all that she has to do, would that be allowed then? Again, that's at the discretion of this council. 
That is for for council to yeah. decide as okay. to to what extent, Councillor Cermak, uh, you would like her to move forward with this. If indeed that is uh, uh, council's decision, that is entirely up to council as to uh, to what extent her involvement would be in regards to uh, these cattle guards. Okay. Thank you. One other. <laughs> One, one brief one, please, and then we'll go to Councillor. If, what is the fencing criteria that we call for if she had to fence the road off? Is it just an electric fence, or does it have to be a five-wire barbed wire fence with access for these wild horses and ATVs and everything, access across this road? Or could she just ban anybody from going in there? We don't have any fencing requirements. So okay. from our perspective, she could construct anything there. I, if, I, if I was providing advice to a producer in this scenario, I would strongly encourage them to check with Alberta Ag and Forestry. Sometimes they have requirements for wildlife fencing. Um, sometimes they have minimum requirements for perimeter fencing. This may not be perimeter fencing. Again, back to Councillor... Yep. Um, 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 Radcliffe. uh, Radcliffe's comment of, sorry, uh, it's right in front of you. Um, <laughs> is this one parcel or not? So if yes. it's one parcel, this isn't perimeter fencing. If it's two parcels, it could. So I, I, um, those answers would all come from the government of Alberta. But I think what your aunt question was is, no, if, if, if she wanted to throw up a two-wire electric along there, you know, with some two-inch posts to keep costs down, if, you know, often when in a scenario where there's lots of grass, That'll be fine. You know, that'll, that'll keep, keep, you know, the livestock out potentially. Could be, you know, easier for the uh, um, recreation to work around it. But we don't have a fencing standard uh, required um, adjacent to our, our right away. Okay, so you're saying that she should look into the Alberta Agriculture yeah. and Forestry. She should check what Alberta, if Alberta Agriculture and Forestry requires anything, then she should follow that. If they don't, she can build whatever uh, uh, standard offense uh, with whatever materials then that, that they want. Okay, thank you. And then Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. I'm, I'm struggling with this issue. I'd like to, to help this lady, but I, I'm not seeing, and I can be informed otherwise, what our obligations are here. That is entirely up to council. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. I, I might, might just say, I believe, and I, I would stand to be corrected, like all of our county maintained roads, we maintain those roads for, uh, for the province, on behalf of the province. And ultimately, as council, we're charged for the safety of our community. So I don't think, for me, although I understand uh, the, the challenge this place is for this leaseholder, I don't think we can ensure the safety of our community just by putting a sign up and say there could be some 1,500-pound objects that might be on the road from time to time. And I don't think that necessarily does our due diligence in providing for safe community. And that's why I'm concerned with this uh, and I also recognize that this is six seven eight thousand acres of, of property and there probably is a value in 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 grazing that property and that would be a business decision I think for that individual whether it's worthwhile to invest in the capital infrastructure she needs in order to maintain some level of liability um, control for for her livestock. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at with it at the moment, and I would look to other comments as well. Um, Councillor Graham. I have the opposite perspective. <laughs> um, I've actually driven with my gravel truck on many loads in a day while these cattle are along the road. The thing for me that makes this kind of a different situation is the right-of-ways. The ditches on this road are huge. They are huge, wide right-of-ways. There are not trees up against the road. These cattle are not going to come out and surprise you. Um, there are wild horses on this road, too. So regardless of what we do, there's still going to be livestock roaming on this road. 
um, it's to me, it's not feasible to ask someone to to fence this, and it just seems like red tape that's going to cause difficulties on this producer's life. And I, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm sick of catering to stupid people. Um, it's. In my opinion, if someone was to try and sue the county, anyone who could go out there and see those ditches, it's there's no reason if you are paying attention while you are driving that you should hit an animal unless they cattle don't run fast enough to sneak up on you in those ditches, in my opinion. Um, and it could be my my farm side coming out too. I, I love when the guy has a sheep out on time. Yeah, he's slow. <laughs> I'm the nosy neighbor that slows right down because I love watching those border collies work. And I mean, a few a couple years ago, cattle were hit on timey. It's not, you know, this is, it's going to happen when they're, they escaped wherever they escaped from and there's potential for this to happen anywhere. I personally am willing to take that risk on this road um, with it being the, the, the situation that it is. And so I would personally be in favor of allowing this producer to put some, some cattle guards in there. Councillor Swanson. I just did a quick addition of uh, the possibility of her to cattle guards, clean out and repair, and that's $65,000. That could build a lot of fence. It doesn't matter if it's four bar or three wire or whatever that is. So in my opinion, there's an opportunity for her to take the responsibility. I, um, I understand. Uh, yes, there's wide, dish, wide ditches there, etc. But uh, kind of agree with Reeve Lohe in regards to you know the safety aspect. So um, I'm uh, leaning towards uh, not being in favor of this. Okay, um, I'll go to Councillor Northcott. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a strong advocate for agriculture and cattle producers. However, this area here is just a little bit, <clears throat> with, in my opinion, with. With the Burnstick Lake Road going through here, I know it's uh, it might have nice wide ditches, which would make easy for fencing. It's easy accessible for pounders and access to it, but it's it's more the nighttime and the dusty conditions. Uh, you know, if there's <clears throat> there's a lot of industry traffic, there's a lot of dust that can be there. Um, I also know this area is also frequented lots uh, by youth and uh, <clears throat> high school students in the summer and stuff. With Burnstick Lake being there, there's, there's so. I would not, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I would not want to see somebody severely injured because of a herd of cattle being on the middle of the road. So if there's other perimeter fencing that is around it and if it's easy access, you know, there's lots of room to be able to, to fence it. That, that's my thoughts on it. It'd be more for safety of residents. Okay, thank you. And uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. My, my biggest concern is we're setting us up for future decisions. Um, and even if we are talking 10 producers coming forward saying, hey, they got cattle guards, I want cattle guards. That's just shy of a million bucks of cattle guards. Um, right, yeah, 600,000 for, for quick numbers for just 10 producers to come forward. And that's not including um, full installation, that's just the guards themselves. Um, and then the maintenance and all the other things that go with it. So my concern is, are we setting up ourselves and future councils for decisions based on a decision we make today? That's where my, where my brain's sitting currently. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cermak. I need a little more clarification before I make a decision on this. Uh, one is, if this is a whole property, if it's one unit, then all she has to do is do perimeter fencing. So that means fencing off our road. If we don't like it fenced off because it's one unit, then we have to do something about it. Because I believe that when she got this, so as I understand, this was one unit that she got totally. It's not two separate units. So if that's a case, I think the ball is in our court. We can look into that. Yeah, I, I need that information because I think this lady needs that we need to justify what we're doing here. And if we have to, then we have to fence the road off. If 
because if a herd lease calls for perimeter fencing only, that's all that she needs. And a cattle guard is part of the per perimeter fencing. I can clarify. Um, the reason why it got here was because the uh, province has said either you need to get the county's permission to run livestock at large on their right of way or you need to fence it. So that's why we're here. Um, she wouldn't have made this request because she's been operating this for a long time. You yeah. know, and, and the Burnstick Lake Road's been upgraded several times the last 20 years. I, I can almost be sure that when that family, and that family runs roots run pretty deep in that community, when they got this disposition or head tax permit or allotment or whatever it is, um, that was probably a go trail. You know, uh, um, and like many leases are, lots and lots of leases have right of ways through them that, that, you know, are still go trails. Very few of them ever get, get improved. Some of them do. And so I, I think that'll be the scenario. But, but we can definitely find out if there is multiple parcels associated with this lease or if the, all that green is one parcel. Um, we can definitely look into that and find that answer, I'm sure. And again, if I may, uh, Councillor Sermat, she did indicate in her letter that uh, the um, Alberta Environment Parks, the given agricologist, did reach out and indicated that there are two options um, currently presented for her in regards to managing these grazing lease. Um, so they did point out that either fence along the perimeter of the road itself, Burnsick Lake Road, or uh, uh, reach out to Clairar County where Clairar County then provides uh, that permission um, to uh, bring in the cattle guards so that that fencing is not required along with uh, a letter from ourselves indicating that uh, we have given permission for this to occur. So there's a bit of somewhat clarity there in regards to the, what, the, what their grazing lease is in this case. So. Follow up? Yeah, um, because the river road, the James River river road comes up and comes into that lease, right? <clears throat> and on the James River road, there is a cattle guard on the east side of that, uh, there that is, it's been there for years and it's still there. So that's part of the perimeter fencing. And that is a county road. That's on the and, river road. And the history yeah, of checking. that would be well before we were incorporated as a municipality. So at that time, it would have been a provincial decision. I'm just, I'm just highlighting that the province is now saying you've got to get <coughs> the approval from the municipality to do those kinds of things again. Um, Councillor Graham. I just wanted to maybe alleviate some of Deputy Reeve Melhoff's concerns. From what I understand of the policy, it is at the, the landowner's expense or the leaseholder's expense to, to maintain and install the, the cattle guards. Um, Deputy Reed Melhoff? I thought her request today was for us to do it and her to just enter into the maintenance. So we would be installing the cattle guards and paying for the installation and she would be entering into the maintenance. I thought that was what her letter request was. I just thought that's if what I, she was requesting. If I understand right, one direction forward would be to install Alberta transportation engineered cattle guards and to have those maintained by the leaseholder but monitored by Clearwater County so that they are in a safe condition. So it would be at the leaseholder's expense to maintain those cattle guards, whatever it takes, uh, as well as cleaning them out so that they're effective at keeping the critters where they're supposed to be, which is on the other side of the road from the cattle guard. Um, ultimately, yeah, that's my understanding. And their expense to install them as well? Yes. As per policy, that's what our policy currently indicates. Again, yeah, it indicates that the applicant will be responsible for the installation and maintenance of the cattle guard. Uh, again, as per policy. Okay. 
Mr. Ammons, I know you, uh, your light is on. Thank you, Evlaid. Yeah, I was just going to expand on Councillor Cermak's uh, point. The cattle guard around the perimeter on the what we call locally the river road, uh, east of the burn stick, that cattle guard has been in place for many, many decades. Um, when the two on burn stick were removed, um, I find it interesting the one on the river road did stay in place. A um, little bit inconsistent. Um, the policy does allow. Uh, this is a council decision, um, and which is why it's written the way it is. Um, the policy does state that the uh, landowner is responsible for the maintenance. Um, it is administration's interpretation of that policy that when we identify the need, we will clean it and build um, just to maintain the safety and the integrity so that there isn't cows everywhere. Um, that's our interpretation of that policy, just for clarification as well. Um, that way we know if the cattle guard gets filled up, you know, um, the landowner isn't right handy, we are going to look after that, um, if that helps clarify. But uh, actually, I was just mentioning to Matt exactly what Councillor Cermak pointed out about that cattle guard on the river road as well, and it, it's been in place for many, many years. Um, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. Just wondering how long it would take to uh, get an answer on, you know, the number of parcels that would be in this grazing lease. If this is something we can uh, get back to this afternoon, or would it take some time to get that information? It's probably going to take more than a few hours to find that out. Yeah, so it would probably be a few days, if not. That, you know, the rest of this week before we would have that answer. Thank you. Councillor Cermak. Uh, so if we grant this lady the right to install these cattle guards at her total cost to put them in, maintain them or everything, um, the CAO said that we would clean them and stuff, then the bill would go to her. If she then we would have to enter into a contract with her and it's between the county and her. Uh, I think this needs to be negotiated with her and us. Um, if she sees fit to spend this kind of money and at the discretion of the county, if she enters into this and we say that it's not being kept up properly or maintained properly, she has to remove it at her expense and they cannot go back in there. So this is a pretty big contract I think we're looking at to do this. Am I way out of ballpark here? Or is it just for us to say, okay, go ahead and do it if you're willing to pay all the bills? Mr. Emmons? Thank you for the question, Councillor Cermak. It it wouldn't be a one paragraph, but it is something administration has in our system. Um, it's a standard liability. Um, so it, as far as size, uh, it would definitely be a few pages, but it wouldn't be that onerous. Um, we, okay. we, we do have that in our database. I, I, I agree with Councillor Graham. I think that she deserves the right to be able to say yes or no to this cost. And I say that if she wants to do that, then yes, we should allow those cattle guards to go in because it says that even if we pave the road, that cattle guard is up to that standard, it can be on a paved road. Thank you. Deputy Reed Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. If that agreement was entered into, would it then sit with the title? So if that next year, that allotment was to be transitioned to another um, producer, would that agreement or contract transition with it so it sits on the title? So whoever has it is responsible for that? Mr. Emmons. Thank you, Lloyd. 
Historically, uh, Deputy Reeve Mayhoff, no, it's with the leaseholder um, because the, the new leaseholder would have to sign a new agreement, again, accepting the terms in play. Um, if the new leaseholder said, you know what, you're a cattle guard, you're a road, I'm not paying to maintain it, um, the county would remove them. So typically it goes with the leaseholder, not with the land. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, additional questions. A couple of possibilities here. We've discussed a lot of things. Um, there could be a motion to incorporate some of those things we've discussed, or there could be also a motion that uh, one councillor was wanting more information. So there's two possibilities, I think, here at the moment, and shades and colours within each of those. So, uh, Councillor Graham. Does everyone feel comfortable to vote on this, or do you need more information? We'll have to. Have, yeah, we have to without having. Well, either a, way, it's a without decision. Without having a so. motion before us, I think it's very difficult to really okay, amend well, that motion, or or uh, you know. So ultimately, that, that's kind of why I presented it as okay. a couple of pass forward here. I would like to make a motion then that council approves Miss Scott's request to install cattle guards on. The Burnstick Lake Road, um, as per policy, at the landowner's expense. Is that sufficient, or do I need more in that motion? If I may, Councillor Graham, um, I know the policy does indicate that the applicant will be responsible for the installation and maintenance of the cattle guard. Um, um, just the fabrication side of things as well, just for clarification, your motion was that. The that it's the fabrication is at her expense as well, or that that's what I'm asking if yes this would yes. be at her cost the fabrication, yes. yeah. including yeah. including the fabrication of them at a I'll, at standard at standard. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, any further discussion on that motion, then, uh, Councillor Sermat? Should we also add to that motion that? Um, it's, it would be, I, I can, how can I word that? Sure, Cliff. sure, sure. Thank you, Reed. Uh, <laughs> Councilor Radcliffe? Uh, for myself, I would like the clarification on the issue of what is perimeter fencing and what isn't? Okay. Which, which would mean a delay? That would mean, I would uh, suggest, yeah, that would mean that you would ask to table, table this motion or postpone this motion. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> and we could put us, uh, Mr. Emmons, please. Thank you, Reeve Lloyd. Respectfully, there's a motion at play. Yeah. Um, that motion has to be dealt with prior to another motion being entertained. Thank you for that. Um, I know what. I know Councillor Northcott was about to say something. If you want to withdraw your motion, that you can do. If and that's why I asked before I made the motion. <laughs> if people wanted it to be postponed, yes. so if if we don't feel that we're ready to vote on this until we have the rest of the information, I'll withdraw my my um, motion. Okay, so the motion has been withdrawn. We would be entertain any other motions at this time. Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Ammons, please. No, thank you, Revalid. And respecting Council's conversation, I'm just, I need to ask how, whether it's one parcel or two, how would that information benefit Council's decision as to allowing cattle guards installed as per policy or not? I, if thank you for that. I, maybe on a personal level, I don't, think it really should really interfere with our decision one way or the other but I would entertain why it's uh, why maybe you can 
shed a little more light on that, Councillor Ratcliffe. Yes, it's, it's from the the issue of safety, really, and, and that, and the uh, amount of traffic on that road. If uh, the road and ditches are wide and sunny, that's probably some of the best grass on that property. So I can see cattle collecting there. You know, and, and looking at the cost of the cattle guards versus what fencing would, would be if that actually is perimeter fence along the road. Mr. Martinson, and then I'll go to Deputy Reed Melhoff. I don't think you'll see the cattle attracted to the, our road away because road lines because the grass. We mow, you know, so by summertime we'll mow half that right away. Um, there's good grass out there, you know, and there's, uh, I think I think someone said five or 6,000 acres of it. So the cows will find cut blocks, they'll find cleared areas, there'll be lots of grass. What they'll come to the road allowance for is um, uh, boredom. So cattle get bored, they go to where the noise is, um, that's often the roads. They'll come to the road for the um, bare ground. Uh, so um, um, cows and bulls um, predominantly, but even younger animals will roll and cover. That's why you'll see paws pawing, uh, bulls pawing the ground and cows pawing the ground. It's not because they're upset necessarily. Sometimes they do that, but it's to cover themselves with dust. That dust in their hide keeps the mosquitoes from being able to penetrate um, their hair. It's like concrete going through their, their hide with dust. So they'll go on, literally roll on the road. You see horses do it as well. Um, they'll go there specifically to uh, um, cool down at night with the roads cool. So that'll be the reasons why they get attracted to the, the road. Um, they're not out there in the winter, so they won't be attracted to any salting that we do on paved sections or anything like that in the future. Um, like you see the feral horses out to Nordig. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't think the grass will be the attractant to them, but it certainly will be other things happening on the road. Councillor Sermat. Thank you. I'd like the motion that uh, Councillor uh, Graham came forward with. So I would like to expand on that motion, if it's being written, on how it was said, that we have to enter into a contract with this lady also. Okay. So that, that motion was withdrawn, but you could, you could restate a motion okay. similar to what she said uh, that okay. would incorporate okay um, I did not get all of the, the, the um, of what I would like to put a motion forward that we is it up on the board there you that go. council approves their request to install cattle guards on the burn stick light as per policy at leaseholders expense, including fabrication of Alberta transportation standards, to Alberta transportation standards. So I guess we don't need the contract in there, just that, okay? Yep, I'm in favor of that, okay? Um, and then Deputy Reeve Milhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, Councillor Radcliffe, you know, brought up a lot of great points and um, Director Martinson like saying that they're coming over to the road like those are then safety concerns and a cattle guard's not going to remove those safety concerns that it just will ensure that those are still there it's fencing that removes those those safety concerns um, is is the leaseholder aware that this is you know a 60 or 70 thousand dollar bill not just the regular five thousand dollar cattle guard. Like, is she aware of the of what we're actually what she will actually be needing to do in order to have this achieved, and that we don't have fencing regulation that makes it so she has to have a very like five strand five strand post so far. We don't have that, so therefore fencing may be potentially a cheaper option. Just okay, thank, you, thank you. I, I don't know if you, 
your lights on, Rick. I don't know if you have an answer to that, but I'll give you a chance. <laughs> Thank you, Revoy. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, if I may, for Council's consideration, it's, it's about presenting an individual uh, options. So administration will, um, based on Council's conversation, forward those costs and inform. Um, and then leave it to the individual to make the choice of what's better for their farming business. And to go back to Councillor Ratcliffe's um, question, well appreciated and thank you for uh, the safety component. Um, if I could maybe add to that, hopefully, with my history on that road, uh, both with cattle guards and without, it's been my experience and witness that it was rare I ever saw animals out on the road. Um, the grass, as Director Martinson has pointed out, um, because this entire area is gravel, uh, the grass isn't all that desirable to the animals anyway because it's so coated with dust that unless they're crossing, um, it was rare actually I saw animals on the road, if that helps, Council Ratcliffe. And uh, Councillor Graham, please. To go off of the grass statement, I don't know if you remember when we did our West Fraser tour last year or whenever we did it, they talked about on the Burnstick Lake where they had logged there, one of the reforestation methods that they tried out there was the checkerboard replanting. So that is this area. So it is, it's not just totally treat. I don't know why I remember this. <laughs> I remember weird things, but it is the checkerboard reforestation there if that's relevant or not to you, just, for, just so you know. Okay. Uh, Councillor Swanson, please. Um, just to address Councillor Cermak's concern from before he made his motion, would he? I'm just going to offer a friendly uh, addition or amendment to this particular, and that would say that uh, along with the condition that Clearwater County enter a long term agreement whereby Ms. Scott would conduct any maintenance and repairs to the ground, like including the maintenance and repairs to the cattle guard. Would you consider that Would a you friendly consider that amendment? Sure. Add to? I think that's all in our policy. Is it? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah it's, um, and that's a good point, uh, uh, Councillor Swanson, but the policy does, by mentioning the policy, that does cover it off in regards to the maintenance. Of I guess my concern was is that, you know, having a, having our motions be a little bit more specific would just keep mm -hmm. us out of, trouble more so anyways okay. that's why I was offering that so perhaps then we'll vote on your amendment then because it is substantial to this uh, to this okay. uh, motion so again discussion on the amendment to the motion Councillor Graham could we please just repeat it before we vote sure um, I'm just basically taking the staff recommendation, the last sentence out of what we've been in our agenda, I'm just saying that uh, that Clearwater County enter a long-term agreement whereby Ms. Patty Scott would, con would conduct any maintenance and or repairs to the cattle guards. That would okay. be an, in addition to what is already there. Okay, thank you. For clarity, we're voting on the amendment only. So all those in favor? And that is carried. So now we have the amended motion before us. Discussion, further discussion on that motion. Um, as a last swing at this, <laughs> I will kind of speak maybe perhaps for the other thousands of producers in Clearwater County that do maintain fences to keep their livestock off of, uh, our, off of our uh, county maintained roads. So I will not be supporting the motion based on the things I've said before and that, that kind of statement. So that's, that's where I'm at. Any further, further discussion? With the amended motion before us, all those in favor? And those opposed? That is defeated. Thank you very much for a very in-depth discussion on that item. Um, I think we maybe have time for one more uh, item here before we take a break. Uh, we're going into um, item 6.2, or so, 6.2, solid waste and 
recycling. And I think we'll be joined by Reed for uh, uh, <laughs> this as well. So I'll give him a second or two to quickly rush in. I know he's been waiting very patiently here. So I shall um, turn the turn the floor across to Mr. Williams to uh, outline this, or maybe maybe Mr. Magnus wants yep. to introduce the items. Okay. So thank you again, Council. This particular agenda item is for Council to consider granting first, second, and third reading with permission to the Solid Waste Bylaw 1140-23 for the purpose of establishing Clearwater Regional Landfill and Clearwater County Transfer Station disposal fees and rates as presented in Schedule A from 2023 to 2025. As per previous Council's direction, a bylaw along with fees was established in April 2021, whereby the Clearwater Regional Landfill would move towards full cost recovery, both from an operational and reserves perspective. Keeping the aforementioned in mind, based on the annual average operational costs from 2020 to 2022, an estimated annual reserve funding allocation required to operate the landfill on a cost recovery basis, the current landfill regional disposal fees would require a modest increase of approximately 2.9% and 1.4% for 2023 and 2024, 2025 respectively. Also, the non-regional disposal fees will see an increase of 0.5% and 1.1% for 2023 and 2024, 2025 respectively. Given landfill disposal fees can have an impact on landfill volumes, administration upon much data analysis determined the fees to be reasonable as typically any significant increase in rates may decrease the overall waste volumes. Furthermore, so long as the current market remains unchanged, the proposed rates would accomplish full cost recovery for the year 2024 and 2025, with only 2023 being below full cost recovery due to, implement, due to the implementation of the fees for only half the year. At this point, I will turn it over to Council for further discussion. Uh, at the conclusion of this part of the discussion, administration will proceed with the 2023 to 2020, 2025 transfer station rates. Okay. Any questions for, uh, for staff? I hear silence. Well, Councillor Graham. Sorry to ruin your silence, Ms. Lahid. I just want to clarify, so for residential, the access card, um, the $204 annually, that does not mean, so our residents can still go to like Crossroads, for example, and they get their card for free to do that. This is just for the landfill? Or do people now, are people gonna have to pay $204 for a card annually to go to their local transfer stations? No, just the uh, once purchased, any resident of Clearwater County that had, has purchased that card, at the fee of $204, that's with them for, for the lifetime that they're a resident of Clearwater County. They okay. do not need to purchase a yearly card. They yeah. Were they originally, give, did you get, did everyone get them for free originally? Yes, that is so correct. this is now gonna be a $204 fee. Um, for only those that the are outside of the region, so non-region, okay. they would have to pay the $204 on okay. an annual basis. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> Okay. Any additional questions? Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Reeve. Um, mine was regards to the uh, page five, um, household waste less the pickup load, $15 minimum. But we have, if we have the cards, that's no long, that's not a, that's why we have the cards, so we don't have to charge the $15 minimum. So if you don't have a card, that's when you get the $15 charge? That is correct. Okay, so, again, so it's not the card and $15, it's card or $15. That's correct. Okay. That These, again, these are for internal purposes, for our own accounting in essence, and it gives us an idea of what it costs the county in terms of working with solid waste and recycling. These charges there, that would not uh, be charged to our residents directly. That's these charges that are indicated already uh, part of their tax roll. 
part of their taxes. Uh, once they purchase that card, that's, they're good to go. Okay. The fifteen dollars is non-regional, so again, um, uh, the non-regional they can purchase a card as well. Uh, um, that's a different color-coded card as well. But for those individuals that don't have a card that are non-regional, then they would pay the fifteen dollar minimum if they were to use one of our transfer stations. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cermak, please. Yeah, I have a, on the oil field one on page two, asbestos. I see that we charge $95. Isn't there a special thing you have to do with asbestos? Doesn't it have to be buried in the ground with four feet or five feet of cover over it? And a $95 price tag is fairly cheap for that. Uh, how do we do that? Good Mr. question, Williams? Councillor Cermak. Um, typically with asbestos is a, you're right, it's a very lightweight material. Um, there are some special transportation requirements, double bags, certain thickness of poly, um, a pre-approval process before it's accepted. So typically what you'll see is a $95 fee. However, there is a handling fee with that. And it usually results in equipment time, depending on how long it takes to manage that material. And that would be an upfront cost where, where, the, uh, where the contractor or the person bringing it in would, would be aware of that. Um, this prevents a couple things. You don't get a severe amount from other places. There was, there was a problem historically with uh, asbestos tape coming in from BC with the condo situation coming into Alberta. So as a protection mechanism, Typically right now, I would say we don't get much more than an average of 10, 10 ton a year, if that, five to 10 ton. It's a very manageable resource, or sorry, a manageable waste stream. So, so there is other costs outside that 95 in handling. Okay, thank you for that, because um, that can get really expensive. And the other thing, I guess, the asphalt. Uh, that's pretty cheap when you're talking that there could be leak and everything else come out of that asphalt. Uh, that can really add on a significant cost to carrying on this line fill. I think $35 is, is pretty economical for somebody to haul in asphalt to you. Very good question, Councillor Cermak. Um, asphalt concrete is a one that uh, when it comes in, there's significantly more weight. So obviously the invoicing gets up higher. We will say if we do get asphalt, we tend to create pads and disposal wet weather operating areas. We try to use it to our advantage. Um, I would say in the case of, we don't see a whole lot of again, quality asphalt coming out to the landfill. It seems to get intercepted somewhere along the line. Um, we do get you know a touch here and there from Clearwater County. Um, but I would say again, significant volumes is relatively low and we do reuse it. We will reapply it and again, put it into the operational side of the, of the landfill operation. Thank you. Okay, any additional questions? Please, please carry on. Yeah. So the second point refers to the uh, transfer station rates. Again, keeping the aforementioned in mind, we will be seeing only a slight increase approximately 2.9% for household waste and construction, demolition, and mixed waste for 2023, and a 1.4% increase for 2024 and 2025 for regional. Non-regional transfer station fees would see an increase of approximately 0.5% for 2023 and up to 1.1% for 2024 and 2025 for household waste. Construction, demolition, and mixed household waste only, a modest increase of 0.5% would occur for 2023. And like the previous um, increase, we would also see uh, a 1.1% increase for 2024 and 2025. Again, administration would like to point out and emphasize the regional transfer station rates are not charged on site to residents of Clearwater County. It is already a part of and included in their taxes. However, any non-regional residents, i.e. outside of the county, are charged on site as per the rates given. 
Again, I'll turn it over to the administration if they have any further discussion pertaining to this aspect of uh, uh, the transfer station rates. Any, any questions? Not seeing any at this time. Anything um, further, Mr. Magnus? That nope, that's it. That's, I'll leave it to it. council. So again, we'd be looking for a motion here to, um, I think, go to first reading of, of this by, of these, of this, um, this would be a bylaw 1140-23? Correct. Uh, sorry, where am I at? Oh, Councillor Graham, sorry. <laughs> um, I would just like to make a motion that Council grants first reading to the Solid Waste Bylaw 1140-23. Okay. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, I call that motion. All those in favour? And that is carried. Um, looking for... Uh, a re or Looking for a motion for second reading. Uh, Councillor Swanson. Yes, I'll make the motion that we grant, uh, that Council grants second reading to the solid waste bylaw. Thank you. Further discussion? Councillor Ratcliffe. I uh, just have the question of um, should we invite public feedback on this before we finalize the bylaw? I will let staff uh, recognize that why there's a difference between this particular bylaw yeah. and um, some of the other bylaws we've recently had public hearings with so well, no. if if you would mr Adams. thank you um as this is schedule of fees it doesn't require um public hearing in it um, therefore it'd be council's discretion if you wanted to provide that opportunity but municipal government act doesn't require this uh, step in the adoption of this bylaw welcome okay. so we have second oh uh, deputy reed Melhoff. uh sorry um we were going we were talking about how the how the cards are good forever um, but then at the bottom of page seven, it says per year. I just wanted some clarification yeah. on that, if that is the case or if they're good forever. No, forever. That would be, we would remove that part. Okay, so. Our apologies. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Again, non-regional, they would have to purchase on a yearly basis. Yeah, but yeah. regional, once they got it, the per That's year can be removed from, from that part of correct. the schedule. Yeah, we schedule. would make that change. Thank you for pointing that out. Mr. Reed? Yeah, just. Sorry, Reed. Deputy Reed Melhoff. Deputy Reed Melhoff. The intent there is that, yes, Clearwater County residents do not, when, once they apply for their card, they do retain that. That's just in the event of a sale of property or a, a change in the ownership and those types of things. Um, then that card typically would be, uh, that number would be removed unless that person's directly going to another residence in Clearwater County. So it's just a matter of taking cards out of the system. So there's not a bunch of cards floating around. So it's a tracking mechanism. Okay. Is that Councillor Cermak? Are you saying that if a new residence comes in, let's say somebody comes and buys my farm, they don't take my card, they have to purchase one, or do they get one free? Uh, Councillor Cermak, they basically get one in the new application. Clearwater County, they make application, they get that card for free. Uh, they're given two cards. If they request more because of multiple residents, that sort of thing, they'd have to purchase those individual cards. Okay. Uh, but two would be given. However, the sale of that property, depending on where you're going, they would take those, typically we'd take those two cards that you previously had, those numbers out of that system. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Again, we have a motion for second reading before us. Any further questions relating to that motion? Seeing none, I call the question. All those in favor? 
And that's carried. I'd be looking for a motion for permission for third reading. Uh, Deputy Reed Melhoff, all those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. And I would be looking for a motion for third reading. Councillor Swanson, all those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. That takes us to the thank end you. of. And thank you so much for joining us and your and your help with answering all our questions today. So that takes us to an appropriate time for, to take a break. We shall be back at, um, let's say, 1250.
Uh, welcome back, everyone. We continue with our um, agenda of the day, and we're down to item 7.1, and that's from the CAO's office of the Wetaskiwin Clearwater Intermunicipal Inter Committee. And I shall turn the floor across to Mr. Emmons to introduce this item, please. Thank you, Eve Lloyd. Good afternoon, Council. This item is before Council, a staff recommendation for Council to make motion stating there are no issues or items pertaining to the Wetaskiwin Clearwater ICF ICC, which is the Intermunicipal Collaboration Framework, and out of that framework comes the Intermunicipal Collaboration Committee. Therefore, no meeting required. So a motion would be required if Council does not wish. Administration for both Wetaskiwin County and Clearwater County have been in contact regarding the ICF meeting that by bylaw would happen in 2023. As neither administrations have any issues or items for discussion, I reached out to Clearwater County's ICF members and found they had no outstanding items as well. As such, administration is suggesting that the upcoming 2023 meeting is not needed. Subsequently, the next meeting would be in 2025. If council agrees that a meeting is not needed and to stay in compliance with legislation, a motion not to have the meeting is required by council today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Councillor Swanson, please. As uh, my division kind of laces up along County Wetaskiwin and I try at our RMA conventions to speak to the councillors there to have, if there's any ongoing issues I can honestly say that uh, we haven't had anything to really talk about yet so um, I concur with uh, Councillor or sorry, Councillor Emmons, CAO Emmons <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm happy to make a motion that uh, we have no issues outstanding with the Clearwater what task when ICF ICC no meeting would be required. Thank you very much for that. Any questions relating to that motion? I can't let this go. When was the last time we actually had one with Wetaskiwin? As <laughs> thank you for the question, Revi. <laughs> uh, no, as as the ICFs are are very new, legislated under the province. This would have been the first one. Um, Anyway, um, administrations <laughs> haven't identified a need. The only thing in the ICC really of subsequent is the uh, maintenance sharing agreement up in the St. Dennis area, up in that far, far north part of the country. Anyway. Great. Thank, thank you so much for that. Okay, I will call the question. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. Um, let's move down. I think uh, while Rick's got the mic, we'll set it across so he can... Uh, go to the CAO's report, please. <clears throat> Thank you again, Reeve The two, March 14th, 2023 CAO report. The Alberta Municipalities 2023 Spring Municipal Leaders Caucus, MLC, takes place at the Weston Edmonton on March 30th and 31st. This event will cover top of mind issues facing communities and give opportunity to hear from government leaders ahead of the provincial election. The event will kick off with lunch on Thursday, which is March 30th, and run until lunch on Friday, March 31st. This year's Spring MLC is being held in conjunction with the President's Summit on the Future of Municipal Government, which will run from March 29th to noon on March 30th. The summit will focus on opportunities and challenges related to intermunicipal collaboration. As per policy, one councillor is authorized to attend and remuneration is at a per diem rate. Councillor Swanson. Uh, yeah, I'm um, just going to look over to you, Reeve Lohate. Is it something that you can attend? I believe having a uh, presence at both the Spring Municipal Leaders Caucus and the future of municipal government would be uh, of Thank high you. importance. Thank you. I certainly can make myself available for that, but if any other member of council would feel uh, motivated to um, represent the county at that, that would be a point of discussion as well. So. I'm in Okay. Okay. Well, I would, uh, I would, if, if you were willing to make 
Would you? I would a make the motion that a motion uh, we authorize Reeve Lohe to attend. Okay. Further discussion? Seeing none, I will call that question. All in favor? And that's carried. I know we have a one o'clock, um, and I know it will probably take a bit of time to. Um, that is has a virtual component, um, so I know it'll take a bit of time to. Um, get that up and going. Maybe what we will do though is I would look for a motion to accept virtual uh, attendance or by uh, a delegation. Sure. Uh, Councillor Cermak, all those in favour? And that's carried. And then of course this item will be in closed session so we will need uh, a motion to go into closed session as well. So. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe, further discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, I call that question. All in favor? Uh, thank you very much. We move into closed session.
Uh, welcome back everyone after our closed session. There will be no motions coming out of that closed session. And we are going to take a short five minute break before we come back to uh, the remainder of our agenda for today.
Most of them. So welcome back, everyone. We continue through our uh, uh, agenda for today. Uh, we're going to go back to item 3.1, and that was minutes of the special council meeting. Those have been uh, amended, so we would need to lift um, lift those minutes from the, the table, if we could. Uh, Councillor Northcott? Add another couple, just small amendments to it. Oh, I oh. apologize. Okay. It's on page three of eight. Uh, three of eight. Yeah, council granted reading of bylaw. I think it just it's missing first reading of bylaw. Eleven thirty-two on December twentieth. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, council granted reading of by just missing the first. First reading. Okay. Is, yep. First reading. Okay. And on page seven of eight. Page seven of eight. <clears throat> yeah. There was the total number of registered attendees at the public hearing was noted as 348. But I was just wondering if we'd be able to put, because I believe that there was a, residents had the opportunity to select whether they were opposed or in favor of the MDB. I was just wondering if that little bit of information could also be put into there. For the number of people opposed, in support, and undecided. Yeah? Um, is that something we can do then? Yeah, okay. Okay. That, then, that would be... Okay, you're okay up. with that yes, then? Please. Okay, any further uh, discussion around those minutes of the special council meeting? If not, I'll call the question. Oh, sorry? The motion to lift. The motion to lift. There's, sorry, it's late in the day. So uh, looking for a motion to lift. I'll make a motion to lift it from the table. Okay, thank you for that. All those in favor? That's carried. And then any further discussion on the minutes? before us that has been amended and amended. Okay, okay. Uh, I will call that question then. All in favor of adopting those minutes? As amended. Okay, and that is carried. Did you, did you oppose that? Okay, okay, good. Okay, that checks that one off the list. Uh, brings us down to, I believe, councillor reports. So um, traditionally, we go to um, councillor Graham first, and so I'll, I will, won't break with tradition today. I'll let you uh, start us off. All right. I'm not going to talk about the things we were all at together because I'm. It's it's getting to my grouchy time of the day. So um, after. <laughs> After our last meeting, I attended the Withrow community meeting. Um, they had a lot of concerns, which I staff are working in have answered many of them already. Um, it was my first time, I missed the meeting last year, so it was my first time going to that meeting and it was a really awesome meeting. It was actually a fun meeting, which was nice after the, the month that we've had and it was just, it was just really, it felt like they were a family there, like they're a tight-knit community and it was just really great. It's it's just like what Clearwater County is all about, in my opinion. Um, Deputy Reeve Melhoff and I atten attended the Ag Service Board meeting. We discussed the wild boar bylaw that will be coming to council when, when it's ready to come here. Um, we chose the Farm Family Award. There were two wonderful nominations this year and the Korth Family one from the Dovercourt area. Um, amalgamation studies, we've all been to them or some of them. Um, Rocky Rec Board. The program guide is available online and it has lots of great information of things coming up in the, the spring and summer here. So I recommend everyone goes and checks that out and they will have printed copies available, but I didn't write the date down. So maybe call before you go and get one. And the Chamber Awards, we most of us were at the Chamber Awards, but it was just a great night. Marty, I have not laughed that long, that hard in a long time. <laughs> I was almost falling off of my seat. He did such a great job and represented the county so well and we are so fortunate to live in this community with so many wonderful businesses and agricultural operations. And that concludes my report. Sue, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry about the phone. <laughs> Caught me off of unawares. And I'll go to the Councillor North Conference. Um, Absolutely, yeah. The uh, the Denim and Diamonds Banquet Awards there that was that was a very nice event. It was very well organized, and uh, so accolades to all the people that were involved in organizing that event. It was very nice. Um, I guess one of the highlights that I have 
I attended a Alberta Council of Nonprofit Day conference. That was kind of neat. I don't know a lot about not-for-profits and stuff, so I, I do a little bit more. There's roughly 300,000 people that work in the sector across Alberta. Um, I don't think that's a good number. They, the, 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 the presenter had said that uh, there are more people that work in that industry, more than the oil field, uh, timber industry, and one other industry I combined. And I, I, I think that's absolutely, that's not good. There's a really big problem that needs to be addressed, you know, because they deal with the domestic abuse, homelessness, uh, addictions, mental health. So there's a really big problem. The root cause really needs to be identified and, and fixed. Um, there was uh, one of the presenters, <clears throat> she was very enthusiastic about it. I kind of observed it. She was very enthusiastic. She was on the stage and she had lots of really good points and she would get, you know, uh, applause from the, from the attendees. There's probably close to about 200 people that had attended. Um, and she was very enthusiastic about this, but she'd said second place to Toronto for the highest immigration numbers across Canada is Edmonton. And she was, but the room was silent. There was, there wasn't, not, there was not one person that, that, that applauded that. I couldn't believe how. So Edmonton is second place for the highest immigration numbers across Canada, second to Toronto. Um, that's, yeah, so there's that. Um, I also attended a, a meeting at the hub um, for the infrastructure there was with uh, some of the staff, you know, from emergency and legislative services community um, and ag. But it just the importance for the buildings, for halls, and uh, to, to be able to meet current fire codes and legislation to be able to hold events uh, is very important. And it would be nice to see if, <clears throat> like, I don't know if economic development community services, emergency and legislative services, if, if really all those organizations, like those departments, need to really come together to have budgets developed and a time frame and a, you know, to, to get the buildings so that we can have uh, community events. So I did that. And other than that, I, I, yeah, that's kind of it. So thanks. Any questions for um, Councillor Northcott, I'll pass the baton to uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I will do my best to be brief, so I'll only go over the things that, again, we didn't do together. Um, uh, Councillor Swanson and I went to an asset management for elected officials. Um, th that was fascinating. Fa and it was, it was a combination of rural and urbans and, like, Summer villages were even there. Like, it was fascinating to see the dynamic in the room when different types of assessment are brought up and how they handle the concerns. Um, I.e., if you're not going to make budget on your rec department, and the way that the community responded toward, like, the room responded towards those questions, it it was very, it was very interesting dynamic to watch rural and urbans in the same room trying to deal with asset management, i.e. cut services, i.e. ask our neighbor for help. It's, it was very interesting um, and it gave an interesting perspective also of the challenges that some of our partners have in dealing with those assets and why they have to make some of the decisions they make and why, anyway, it was, I, there's two more sessions. I encourage anybody that can go to go because it it was very good. And um, our I, I'm sure our administration are are not going to super love when we talk asset management because now Michelle and I know what questions to ask even more so. <laughs> no, it was it was very good. Um, I I also attended a. Um, Society for Hospital Expansion in Central Alberta presentation. They did a C, uh, presentation to CTV and CBC and the Mayor and Reeves um, committee. Very good. And I'm just going to throw out some interesting numbers just to give you guys an idea of some of the struggles in Central Zone um, in general. These were based on 2017 audited financial numbers because that's what they could get at the time when they were building their presentation. Because Alberta Health Services is a contracted service to the province, their financials need to be FOIPed. They're not readily available. So they FOIPed the 2017 financials. Um, 
per capita Edmonton zone, $2,662 per capita in the Edmonton zone. Calgary zone, $2,533. North zone, $2,086. South zone, $1,513 um, per capita. Central zone, $228 per capita put into healthcare. 31% of the population and $228 per capita in 2017 was allocated to central zone. It's ridiculous. Um, since then, we've been given $1.8 billion for um, upgrades to the Red Deer Hospital that have not yet commenced whatsoever. Engineering has not been stamped. The, a committee has not been struck. Not a single thing has been done to do anything with the money that has been allocated for the hospital expansion in Red Deer. Um, they came out with four asks. They want a champion to actually advocate for the upgrades to the Red Deer Hospital or changes to the Red Deer Hospital, even if that means another location, something. Um, equal representation on the AHS executive board, because currently there is no central zone representative on the AHS board. Um, patient capacity and physical infrastructure and resources transition plan. So they want to actually determine where we're going to put all these patients because right now Edmonton and Calgary is where they go because we don't have capacity. Um, and how are we going to get the, the human resources to actually staff a facility once we get it? Because nobody wants to come and work here because the payment structure for them is significantly, di is significantly different than in Edmonton and Calgary. Um, the doctors are paid... Um, just on their on-call time and often not called in in Edmonton and Calgary, whereas in Red Deer, they are working all night long and then unable to do anything elective during the day because there just isn't enough physicians and there isn't enough allied health professionals to actually support the physician work because Central Zone doesn't get as many nurse practitioners, physician assistants, et cetera. It's actually a 10 to 1 ratio, Central Zone to the to, um, urbans. Um, and they would like the public to attend a healthcare rally uh, May 2023. When I get a date for that, I will let our team know. Um, they want to do that in Red Deer um, and work with all of the surrounding rural hospitals, et cetera, to try to um, advocate for that because they are our hub for trauma, et cetera. Um, those numbers to me were very astounding and proved why Central Zone is in the position it's in right now. Um, attended a North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance Values Workshop. So we, the board, is uh, trying to facilitate to ensure that the direction of the North Saskatchewan Watershed is going in the, in the direction we want it to do. So every four years they go through um, a facilitated workshop to ensure that we're still on the right path. Uh, the data from that has not yet come back to us because we just had it uh, here last week. So I'm looking forward to seeing um, what comes of that. Um, I met with Spark, which is our, our healthcare team healthcare engagement team in Sundry to make sure that we aren't duplicating um, efforts. So where we overlap in Caroline, we wanted to make sure that <laughs> we're not both trying to do the same thing and, I, and end up rowing the boat in the opposite direction. So we really want to try to make sure that we're working together as much as we can. We're also working on setting up a meeting with our northern partners in Brazo so that the whole eastern slopes can have a together um, path so that we're not duplicating our efforts. But and everything else I attended with the team here other than the Clearwater Regional Fire RCMP hockey game. That was so much fun to watch. I actually got to do the puck drop. I've never done that. I was so nervous doing that. It was, it was great and awesome to see the entire community come out to a sold out game for charity. So that was great. And I'll get off the soapbox, sorry. Super. Thank you so much. Any questions for uh, Councillor Melhoff? I'll pass the baton to you, Neil. I think Sydney had a question. Oh, sorry, Sydney. I was just going to ask who won the hockey game. <laughs> the RCMP. Ah. <laughs> Councillor Ratcliffe, please. In the interest of not uh, pushing anybody closer to a critical grump level, I have. Uh, <laughs> We're already past that. Yeah. <laughs> I've uh, just gone to the uh, amalgamation meetings, which is very early on, so no real results from that. Um, otherwise, I think I've been relatively quiet. Okay. That's oh, my... Thank you. And uh, Councillor Cermak. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say, not like Channing. Um, <laughs> I love the whole <laughs> <time>. <laughs> I, um, 
I did attend the Rocky Chambers meeting or the, the supper on Friday night. Awesome. Anybody that, if you can get a ticket, go to it next year. It is just a fantastic night to spend. Um, the other thing was I attended the ag meeting at Caroline and it looks like we're gonna have to spend in excess of probably 150,000 to get the hub up to a standard where we can have at least a thousand people on the floor in the arena uh, at any one given time. So that's gonna be in the budget and stuff. And the other thing was on Saturday, Sunday, I attended the Caroline Curling or Caroline Carnival and it was fantastic. I think they had about 70 skaters in the curling or in the figure skating club and it was fantastic. If you do get a chance to go and see some of these young kids from age, I think they, I think Megan, my granddaughter is a coach of it. Uh, she told me that I think the youngest one was five and the oldest I think was 17 or 18. And they had one area there where they did a choreographed thing and they were skating around and there were 17 of them out in the ice and no mishaps. It was fantastic to watch. So if you get a chance, go and see it. Okay, any questions for Councillor Cermak? The baton passes to Councillor Swanson. All right, um, I, I'm just gonna quickly go back because I missed the last council meeting. So I was engaged, I'm gonna go back to February 15th, the last that council meeting. I was with the Tamarack Transit Community Engagement at the Rocky Legion for both sessions. Um, of course, we did the special meeting. A Parkland Library Board did a virtual meeting uh, with the board orientation, and they do have an advocacy plan for the upcoming provincial election. Uh, of course, that was pre-budget uh, uh, budget drop, but with the budget drop, they're very happy with what the initiatives were uh, laid out in that. Um, so February 27th and 28th, I attended the Alberta Tourism Industry Summit. There was nine panels over two days with 30 speakers, which included provincial and federal ministers. The biggest takeaway is that the tourism that exists in every municipality across Canada, it is the largest industry because it touches 24 different ministries. It is vastly undervalued. Tourism is the number one export. We attract the visitor economy. We are the number one employer of youth and women. And there's an expected growth of 35% in the next 10 years. Uh, Premier Smith and Minister Lowen spoke about an upcoming Crown Land policy that is being developed. We'll hear more about it um, probably after the election. And they are really focusing on the rural tourism with more trails and campgrounds. So of course we will be affected out west. So we will hear more about that, I would imagine, during the red. Um, Part of that uh, Crown Land policy is uh, we know that there's a delay in getting answers from a partic that particular ministry of, as far as getting it. They want to shorten it to six weeks. That is the biggest ask. So if we can get answers for permitting in six weeks, that will be phenomenal because right now it takes so, so much longer. Um, Great to hang around with, uh, you know, other industry, tour tourism industries. Of course, the indigenous tourism is, they don't have enough product, so they are, you know, that, and it's very much in demand. So it was a good two days. Um, Alberta Council put their vir virtual uh, meeting about the government review. I forwarded the link and the password to you all. Uh, attended the uh, RMA asset management session with Councillor Debbie Reeve Melhoff. Uh, the next day, I attended the Ralph Smurth Farmer Richards Municipal Law Day. The topics were Land and Property Rights Tribunal, update uh, the updating the standard of construction contracts, public hearings, workplace employment issues, and of course the bare pit questions. It was very, very good. Uh, last Tuesday I was invited to the Haminga Healing Force Gathering of Knowledge with Cree Elder Iki Margaret Cardinal. It was an excellent day of Indigenous teachings and I was honoured to attend, listen and share. Of course, the community prayer breakfast uh, was um, not an empty seat. Great breakfast and of course a great message. 
um, did attend the virtual web webinar of Deputy Minister Dave Williams in regards to the update for the Stronger Foundations, which has to do with community and seniors housing, the impacts of the budget there. And then I also attended the webinar for Canadian Council on Invasive Species. I found it on Facebook, registered. It was about wild pigs, the one health threat uh, by Dr. Uh, Wayne Lees. It was recorded, and when the recording is released, I will forward it to you all. But very, very interesting because they spoke about the initiatives to cite, report, and trap and eradicate the wild pigs, and it was a lot of it coming from Manitoba. Um, yeah, so that was really, uh, really good. And my one ask is um, I've noticed that we may have a gap in our monthly capital infrastructure report. And I guess my ask would be that we have updates from the Rocky Gas Co-op in regards to the progress of getting natural gas into Nordegg. If we could see uh, on a percentage base of how much was spent, how much is complete, and expect com uh, completion date. Great. Uh, questions for Councillor Swanson? Well, thank you very much. And uh, very briefly, I'll just, uh, many, of, many of you have already mentioned this, but uh, the amalgamation uh, study with uh, the village has been ongoing. We still have one, um, one session upcoming, and that's a virtual session, I believe, on the 23rd. So uh, you can probably follow the county website to find your way into that session. Uh, great feedback so far. Hopefully we can work towards uh, removing barriers for uh, us moving forward to become a stronger region. Um, ultimately, uh, my calendar has looked, uh, I mean, it's filled, it's blue, but um, many of the same events that we've all went to over the last number of weeks. I will report on the Rocky Community Learning Center, good work happening there for sure, as well as with FCSS, that money is getting out in, being used within our community to um, really support support families in the, in the area. Um, did have the uh, meeting with um, our drop-in session for the counselor. I was had people to talk to the whole session. They, however, did not eat all the donuts. That was left up to me, and we want to make sure that next time all those donuts get eaten. So please, please mark your calendar and come and visit me or your other counselor. Uh, in those in those sessions as well. Great, uh, great evening held with the uh, Chamber of Commerce with uh, not only uh, local business awards, but our uh, ag, ag community awards. It was a, I think maybe the highlight of the year for me. That was a great evening and I appreciate, uh, appreciate the company I had there as well. So that was, that was terrific. Um, and I think just looking at I think that, oh, one other thing I should mention, uh, David Thompson, Rec Board, um, uh, kind of exciting uh, uh, work there uh, the other night, uh, kind of reviewing the potential playground configurations for the Leslieville Recreation Area. So they put a lot of heart and time into giving a series of recommendations to our Ag and Community Services team, and hopefully those will be coming back to council uh, in, in, a, in the near future, and uh, I think it'll be good for uh, the Alessio community to get some, uh, some playground facility there, and that rec facility is gonna be great, a great fit with the new David Thompson High School, which I did have a chance to uh, walk through, uh, and uh, I think as council gets a chance to view that as well, they'll be very impressed with what's there and how that's gonna serve our community for generations to come. So I think it's, it's a great facility. Everybody seemed to be very happy uh, with, with the end results there, so. And with that, unless there were any questions, um, Councillor Northcott. Thank you, Reeve, I don't have any questions. <clears throat> I just had one more little thing to refer to, okay, yeah. Uh, just to report, I apologize for the... Your time is gone. Sorry, you can't say anything. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Well, it's 10 to 6, cool. so we're getting close. Go no, ahead. I just wanted to report, uh, just for all of council, and I'm sure you've had two, but uh, many, I've had quite a few residents that are patiently waiting to see the next steps for the MDP, mm. for the Municipal Development Plan. Um, yeah, so I've been, had quite a few people ask me just to see what the next steps and sort of when that's going to take place. Okay, uh, so I would be looking for a motion to accept reports for information. 
Um, Councillor Swanson, all, all in favor? And that's carried. Um, also, there's councillor remuneration has been circulated. Um, any, uh, anything to note there? If not, I'd be looking for a motion to accept. Uh, councillor Graham, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, two uh, letters of correspondence. Uh, anything to highlight on either of those? If not, I'd be looking for a motion to accept for information or receive for information. Uh, Councillor Cermak, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, takes us to item 10, notices of motion. Would there be any notices of motion? Going, going, gone. Uh, and then we have went through, I believe, everything else on the agenda other than item 12, which is adjournment. So I'd be looking for that motion. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Northcott, all, all in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much for another uh, attending for another marathon day here. I think great discussions have uh, happened today, and I think uh, look forward to the next meeting. Uh, see you then in a couple of weeks.